The Duke's Marriage of Convenience Book One in the Seymour Siblings Trilogy by Fiona Myers Narrated by Catherine Bilson Chapter One A gentle breeze swept across the lush green pastures of the sought-after estate in the county of Somerset. The staff at Woodlock Manor had been busy preparing for a very important visit by two young people who were arranged to be wed. The betrothed couple were to finally meet after many months of negotiations between their respective families. The atmosphere at Woodlock Manor was bustling as the help prepared every last detail. The maidservants served a delicious breakfast on the terrace, while the manservants ensured the grounds were in pristine condition. Merriment and excitement were in the air. However, in the east wing of the manor, submerged nearly entirely in a bath of warm water, Lady Kitty Dunn did not share in the excitement of those around her. Of course, she would not openly admit her misgivings in front of the two young maids who were busy washing her long black hair. The sweet aroma of flowers allowed her to drift into a surreal wonderland where there was no need for her to jeopardize her beliefs for anyone, let alone a man she had never met. Arranged marriages were simply archaic to Kitty's way of thinking, and she could not believe that she was being forced into such a dire situation. But her temporary wonderland dreams were very far from the real world, as she was fully aware. Her mother, Lady Dunn, the Countess of Dunn, had prepared her only daughter for this exclusive gala, as she ceremoniously referred to it and proceeded to compliment her daughter's suitor as a man of integrity and outstanding reputation. He was considered one of the most eligible bachelors in the county, if not the country, and his wealth far exceeded most of the other eligible men. This was the sole reason Lady Dunn and her husband, the Earl of Dunn, had desired that James of Somerset wed their daughter. Despite the Earl's formidable reputation, their family was on the verge of bankruptcy. The Earl's business partner had embezzled a great deal of money from their joint business venture, leaving Lord Dunn to stand among the ruins of his fortune as the ashes rained down around him. Arranging a marriage between his daughter and James of Somerset would ensure their family's financial survival and rescue them all from a life of poverty. Of course, Kitty was well aware of the situation but it most certainly did not stop her from expressing her distaste for the arrangement itself. Despite not having ever met Lord James, and the fact that she was in no position to judge him or despise him, she was, however, not impressed with the depths to which her parents had stooped. Her annoyance at her parents had somewhat coloured her view of her new suitor, even before their first meeting. Unfortunately, there was not much she could do regarding the situation. Plans had been made, and her family had travelled to Woodlock Manor to meet with Lord James. The bedchambers were far more luxurious than she had ever seen, with light rose inlaid wallpaper and gold trim. The furniture was constructed of solid cherry wood, and three large windows provided a panoramic view of the meadows outside. It was certainly a comfortable and luxurious lifestyle in which she was likely to find herself in future, but no amount of extravagance in the entire world would make her wish this of her own accord. There you are, my lady, the maid servant said in a soft voice, and Kitty transferred her glance to the serving girl rather than continue focusing on the sunlight that danced through the drapes. Oh, do make haste, child. Lady Dunn, who had been sitting quietly on a chaise near the window throughout the duration of Kitty's bath, spoke in an impatient tone. There is still much to do. Kitty rose to her feet and allowed the maidservants to wrap her in soft muslin as she stepped out of the bath. The warm air inside the bedchamber allowed a comfortable transition from the heat of the bathwater to where she would now be dressed for her meeting with Lord James. The young maids worked gently and diligently as they first dried Kitty's tresses with a cloth and afterward dressed her in her inner wear, the soft fabric skimming her skin. The sensation caused her to shiver, but it was more a reaction born of anticipation and nerves rather than excitement. 
the weight of responsibility sat heavily on Kitty's shoulders. She was aware this was the only way in which her family's financial survival could be ensured, and she most certainly did not wish for her mother and father to be punished for something that was entirely out of their hands. The servant slipped a lovely pale blue day dress over her head and assisted her in straightening it out, then tying it at the back. She caught sight of her reflection in the mirror, and a small smile brightened her visage. She had not expected to enjoy any part of this ridiculous preparation, but she had to admit the dress was perfection. The colour suited her skin perfectly, and the style accentuated the curves of her body. She was not as petite as most young women her age, but her curvy body apparently made her even more sought after by Lord James, if the gossip she'd overheard among the maidservants was anything to go by. Her mother, of course, disagreed. It is a good thing you have been blessed with a striking face, my dear child, Lady Dunn pointed out nonchalantly. Every time she did this, the action annoyed Kitty immensely. She was convinced her mother did not approve of her daughter's body because Kitty enjoyed being out of doors. Even more appalling, at least according to her mother, was Kitty's love of horses. Kitty had been interested in the amazing creatures since she was a young child and had ridden her first mare when she was only five years of age. Her father had taught her to ride, which annoyed the Countess no end. In the Countess's opinion, it was not proper behaviour for a lady of Kitty's stature and lineage to be undertaking such unladylike pursuits. Of course, Kitty paid her mother little heed and spent much of her free time riding her father's horses. She adored them and hoped that her future husband would at least share her love for the majestic beasts. If not, their dinners as a married couple would be rather quiet. One of the maidservants gently brushed her dark locks, while the other intricately wove the hair with her fingers, placing white blossoms between the layers. Kitty studied her reflection as she was transformed from a young woman who spent too much time out of doors into a refined lady who would soon be the Duchess of Somerset. Lady Dunn moved across the room, catching Kitty's eye in the mirror. Her mother's expression was even more pleased than her previous one. My dear girl, may I be so bold as to say you have not looked more beautiful in your entire lifetime? That certainly does not seem complimentary toward my usual ungainly features, mother, Kitty retorted with a grimace. I wish not to insult you. You look beautiful, was all I was trying to say. Then why not simply say it? There is no need for such theatrics, Kitty said. Lady Dunn pursed her lips, apparently stopping herself from uttering a word that was not suitable to be heard especially by their host's young staff. Kitty was not entirely convinced her mother was right about her current state of beauty, but she knew better than to argue. Where is father? she inquired instead. I left him to his own devices, although I do suspect he is in Lord James's grand library. You are as aware as I am about how your father can immerse himself in a world that does not exist, Lady Dunn answered. This time it was Kitty who pursed her lips to stifle the words that nearly escaped. It was no secret that the marriage of her parents was also arranged, and despite enduring a union that had lasted more than twenty years, Kitty was well aware of how miserable both her parents were to this day. It was one of the reasons she was so set against arranged marriages. Sometimes love did not grow with time. Her father was a quiet man, passive at the best of times. A well-read gentleman of fine lineage and intelligence, he was not boastful, nor did he treat his servants and staff as if they were beneath him. He was humble and would often be found in the kitchen late at night, playing cards with some of the manservants. Or even in the stable, wandering among his beloved horses. Her mother, on the other hand, had been raised with a silver spoon of privilege in her mouth and would not even dream of speaking directly to a maidservant. It was simply a product of her family experience, but her mother's haughty attitude often infuriated Kitty. 
Kitty had inherited her father's kind heart and adored the maidservants at their own estate. She would miss them all dearly when she no longer resided there. Soon she would become the Duchess of Somerset and settle in Woodlock Manor with her new husband and staff she didn't know. It would most certainly be a strange and difficult adjustment, especially since she did not wish for this marriage to take place at all. It was not that Kitty did not believe in love. She simply didn't believe in forced love. One cannot be compelled to fall in love with a particular person, and as her father had philosophized many times, sometimes the heart desired what it desired, no matter how inconvenient. Kitty pressed her lips together as she gazed at her reflection and cocked her head. Nervous bubbles rose up inside her, despite her best attempts to not allow this meeting to affect her too much. She was to meet the man she would soon marry, whether it was what she wanted or not. There was no need to be nervous. She had only heard great and noble things about Lord James, but unfortunately, that knowledge did not make the coming situation any less stressful. Other people's words were not credible. Most of them did not know the man personally. Utter perfection! Her mother beamed beside her, distracting Kitty from the imminent tragedy that lay before her. There will be no doubt that His Grace will fall madly in love with you the moment he sets his gaze upon you, my dear. Kitty glanced at her mother over her shoulder and tried very hard not to roll her eyes. Perhaps her mother was under the impression Lord James may fall at her feet in a love-filled swoon, but she was not convinced. Not in the least. In fact, she was not certain that she would even meet with her betrothed. Through the window, she eyed the thick foliage of trees on the other side of the meadow. It was abundant enough to get lost in, if one wished it. Are you ready, my dear? Her mother smiled and held out her hand, sheer excitement radiating on her face, her green eyes twinkling with hope. Despite Kitty's initial instincts to show defiance, or perhaps give a witty retort that her mother would certainly not appreciate or find amusing, she reined in her rebellious feelings and nodded quietly. She stood up from the stool, ready to face her future. The skirt of her dress slid to the floor, and Lady Dunn's eyes sparkled even more. Her mother clutched a hand against her chest and sighed. Utter perfection, she repeated. Unfortunately, Kitty felt nothing like perfection. Chapter 2 Lord James of Somerset stared pensively out the large window of his study, his gaze fixed on nothing in particular. The marvellous view that lay before him did not appease him in any way. He had spent his entire life at Woodlock Manor, his father's estate. As the eldest son of the Duke of Somerset, he had inherited the property after his father's passing. James adored the estate, with its long hallways, luxurious rooms, and immaculately kept gardens. So many fond memories of childhood. For several years he had lived here alone, but he had always been painfully aware that it was his duty to marry one day. For the eldest son, love rarely entered into the equation. He could not deny that he felt some bitterness in the situation, as his younger brother William and his sister Lizzie both had the privilege of marrying whomever they pleased. As the eldest sibling and heir to his father's lineage and title, James was responsible for carrying on the reputation of his family name. Despite the fact that his mother and father's courtship had been filled with love and passion, which James's mother had spoken of constantly before her death, James knew it was still expected that he enter into a marriage of convenience. Unfortunately, there was not a woman he had met thus far who remotely stirred his feelings. Despite his parents' affection toward one another and their sterling example of a successful union, James had no desire to marry. When the Earl of Dunn approached him at a gentleman's club in town, James was initially under the impression the Earl had been dipping rather heavily into his cups. 
The club was a notorious place where civilized men became quite the opposite, but much to James's surprise, the Earl was as sober as the morning sun. He was equally as surprised when Lord Dunn requested they speak in private. Dunn's proposition that James enter into marriage with the Earl's daughter was both intriguing and abhorrent. Intriguing for its very unexpectedness, especially given he had not heard anything whatsoever about the young woman in question. Abhorrent, because the idea of a marriage arranged for business reasons rather than love made him sceptical in regards to the union's success. It was a strange request from the Earl, especially in such an unexpected time and place. James had agreed to meet with Dunn at a later date to discuss the matter in deeper detail. He had since learned the Earl and Countess of Dunn were one of the many families in Somerset with impeccable reputations, and Lord Dunn's business ethics and the manner in which he managed his enterprises were truly admirable. The same could not be said of the Earl's business partner, and James began to get an inkling of why Dunn had approached him with such an offer. Despite the fact that James was not previously aware Lord Dunn had a daughter, he deemed the offer one for serious consideration. The two men had met on a few more occasions to discuss the finer points of this arrangement, and they soon came to a mutual agreement. Although James felt forced to enter into an arranged marriage to appease his family, he decided that Dunn's daughter was probably the best option. He hoped his decision was one that would have made his parents proud if they were still alive. Of course, his brother and sister had been at pains to offer James their sympathies, but in James's opinion, they had not seemed sincere. His two siblings seemed to draw significant amusement from James's painful duties, including his upcoming marriage of convenience. William had teased him relentlessly for agreeing to marry a woman on whom he had not yet laid eyes. What if the young woman is not what you expected, dear brother? You are to be wed to her, expected to bed her, and spend the rest of your life with her, and yet you do not know how her face appears in the moonlight. William had laughed, shaking his head. What if she is someone you simply cannot tolerate? Or perhaps the Earl has gone mad and he does not even have a daughter. James wanted to growl at his brother, but instead he ignored the teasing. He had given Lord Dunn his word, and he was not prepared to break the arrangement, regardless of what the young woman turned out to be like. On the morning they were to meet at last, he waited in his study, confessing only to himself that he felt somewhat unsure. He caught sight of his reflection in the window, his dark brown hair meticulously parted and brushed neatly to the side, and he sighed. It would soon be time for the circus to begin. The sounds of his staff readying for the breakfast meeting with Dunn's daughter echoed through the hallways. They had been preparing for this occasion even before the sun rose. Lord Dunn and his family had arrived late last evening, and James had only met with the man briefly before retiring for the night. Lady Kitty had her own bedchamber, and Lord and Lady Dunn's chambers were next to their daughters. He had sent two of his best maidservants to Kitty's chamber to assist her with preparations, which James hoped would make her feel more comfortable. Woodlock Manor would soon become her home, and if she was feeling anything like he was right now, she would be in need of a friendly face. A knock sounded on the door, and James stepped away from the window. Enter. The door opened. It was his sister, Elizabeth. She entered in a flurry, her red cloak securely wrapped around her shoulders, and satin gloves held in one hand. Are you ready to meet your betrothed, brother? Her voice was bright and cheery, and he scowled at her. What are you still doing here? I thought you and William were leaving first thing for the day. Lizzie rolled her eyes. Well, that was the plan. But we both are fully aware of how William can take his time with things. Such a tedious man at times. His sister sighed. It is no wonder Mother complained about his birth. It lasted nearly two days. James's scowl slipped away and was replaced by a slight grin. 
he still recalled the stormy night his younger brother came into the world. To his young eyes, William had been the ugliest baby that ever existed. Even the horse's foals were much more handsome than William. Of course, his brother had improved in looks as he grew. He was now known as the dashing and handsome one of the family. No hurrying William when he's not ready, I agree, he said with a chuckle. Will you be well here on your own? Elizabeth asked, causing James's nostalgic thoughts to evaporate. I live at the estate by myself. Why would I not be well? Elizabeth stared at him. Because today is no ordinary day, brother. Today you will finally meet Kitty, your betrothed. Your companion for the rest of your life. Must you make it sound so dramatic? James's scowl came back with a vengeance. You've resided at this estate in isolation for far too long, and it will be a big adjustment to have someone else here. Will she be allowed into your chambers? James sucked in a breath, shocked at his sister's impudence. I hardly think that is appropriate. You and I both know how private you are, brother. I am merely wondering if this marriage will encourage you to open yourself up a little more. Elizabeth fiddled with her gloves, as if aware she may have gone too far. I feel a small sadness for the young woman. It must be difficult to uproot oneself and settle in a new place with someone you do not even know. At least for you, brother, you are in familiar territory. James stared wordlessly at Elizabeth and shifted his weight back and forth. The conversation had taken a turn that increased his discomfort and he wasn't sure how to end it. Before he could formulate a response, his sister spoke once more. But perhaps that is why Lord Dunn arranged this meeting between you and the lady, to set her at ease before being thrown to the wolves. And what do you mean by that? James asked, his annoyance growing. As I have mentioned many times in the past, James, the Seymour blood flows strongly in your veins, and that means you are stubborn and unwavering. In many cases that is a positive trait, but do not overdo it. I cannot promise anything, he said. James, she is your betrothed. Although it is a business arrangement made by both you and Lord Dunn, you agreed to it. Promise me that you will at least make an effort to help this young woman feel welcome and comfortable. His sister stared at him, her large eyes beguiling. He cleared his throat. As I said, I promise. I see you are making promises again, brother. William's voice interrupted them as he entered the study, his manner conveying the confidence that James wished he had. William appeared comfortable in any given situation, perhaps as a result of not being required to follow in their father's footsteps. Or perhaps his confidence sprouted from his dashing looks. William and he differed not only in personality and demeanour, but also in their features. James had dark hair and green eyes, as opposed to William, who was fair with blue eyes. William was also taller and leaner than James, which made the latter feel incompetent at times. He might be the oldest sibling, but when he stood beside his brother, people often looked to William, assuming him the one in charge of the family. That had its own set of disadvantages and problems at times. He could do nothing to change the situation, and had simply learned to live with it over the years. I see you have finally graced us with your presence, Elizabeth said to William, as she slipped on her gloves. Shall we leave? The carriage is waiting downstairs. Are we really leaving our dear brother to his own devices? William grinned in amusement. Or are you ashamed of your siblings, James? Or perhaps it is your bride of whom you are. William, that is quite enough, Elizabeth interjected sharply. Do not speak for me, Lizzie, James said, annoyance in his tone. He then turned to his brother. This arrangement was drawn up between Lord Dunn and myself, for the good of the whole family, which means the two of you. 
It is not appropriate for you to say anything negative about Lord Dunn's daughter, William. That action is simply unacceptable and beneath you. There is no need to attempt to make me feel guilty for not inviting either one of you to this meeting. It is clear that you find the whole situation amusing and continue to mock me for choices I am forced to make. William's mouth opened and closed like a fish, considering James's words, and then he turned swiftly and exited the study. Elizabeth bowed her head. I apologise. Not on his behalf, sister, James said, as he raised his hand. Lizzie glanced up, her lips twisting a little. Would you escort me to the carriage? Of course. She flashed him a brief smile, and they quietly left the study. Not a single word was exchanged as they made their way down the long corridor and through the great hall. Maidservants still scurried about, carrying large vases with flowers. James sighed. I should be grateful for all the staff's efforts, but I cannot help feeling as though I am backed into a corner, sister, James admitted, as he opened the front door for Elizabeth. They stepped out into the clear June morning, and he inhaled slowly. At least it is beautiful weather to be backed into a corner, brother, she pointed out. James, do not fret. You have always been a man of impeccable taste, and your choices had never come back to haunt you. You will be fine. And I have heard many wonderful things about Kitty. You have? When? I have my sources. Elizabeth winked at him. For now, I must go, before William orders the coachman to leave without me. Thank you for the encouragement, James said, sincerely and gratefully. You are most welcome. I will see you at dinner. Elizabeth placed her hand briefly on James's shoulder before making her way to the carriage where their brother waited. James watched as she climbed onto the vehicle and they rolled out of the estate grounds. He stood perfectly still until the carriage was entirely out of sight and sighed wearily. Your Grace, he heard behind him, and he slowly turned. Roland, James's most trusted manservant, stood on the cobblestones. Roland. Pardon the intrusion, Your Grace, but breakfast is ready to be served on the terrace. Thank you, Roland. I will be there shortly. Very well, Your Grace, the man said with a nod. As he turned away, James called him back. Roland? Yes, Your Grace. Have you seen Lady Kitty, perchance? Indeed I have, Your Grace. What can I expect? James shifted his weight, wondering if he really wanted an answer. It is not my place to say, or to judge a young woman solely by her looks and not knowing her in the least. But she is beautiful, and on first appearance, a fine young woman to have as Your Grace's wife, Roland answered politely. The maids who tended to her this morning speak very fondly of her as well. Relief swept through James's chest, loosening the tightness around his heart. That is indeed good to hear, Roland. Thank you. The manservant bowed his head. It is indeed my pleasure, as always, Your Grace. Chapter 3 Kitty's heart pounded in her chest as she seated herself between her mother and father on the terrace. It was a magnificent day, the bright blue sky clear of any clouds, and the cheerful singing of birds from afar eased the nervous tension that held her shoulders taut. Within a few moments, she would meet the Duke of Somerset, the man her parents had arranged for her to marry. The man to whom she was expected to be polite, despite the feelings of dread curling around her heart. How could she keep up appearances as a delighted young lady who would soon be the Duchess of Somerset, when that appearance was anything but the truth? She must do it. There was no other alternative. Never in her entire life had Kitty rebelled against her father's wishes, and today, being fully aware of her family's precarious financial situation, she had no choice but to continue to act as he wished, 
even if it was at the risk of her own personal happiness. Kitty straightened her shoulders, lifting her chin as she noticed her mother's glare of disapproval from the corner of her eye. She inhaled slowly through her mouth, telling herself not to be so ridiculous. Lord James was just a man. No need to be this frightened of what the future would hold. Footsteps sounded from inside the manor house, slowly getting closer, in perfect tempo with her pounding heart. She turned her head toward the door as her mother and father rose to their feet. Quickly, she followed suit. The Duke stepped into the bright sunlight, and Kitty had to remind herself quite sternly not to drop her mouth open or stare too hard. Goodness, he was nothing like she'd expected. His chiseled jawline was much stronger and more masculine than the one she'd constructed in her imagination. With his dark brown hair, he was certainly a very handsome man. His posture and his broad shoulders spoke of a man filled with pride. Something flared in Kitty's belly as she stared into his intense green eyes. No, indeed. Lord James of Somerset was not what she'd imagined at all. She felt quite breathless until his gaze slid away from her to land upon her parents. Your Grace! Her mother and father were in unison as they greeted the Duke politely. Lord and Lady Dunn, their host answered in return. Welcome to Woodlock Manor. I do apologize for our brief encounter last evening. I had manners that required my urgent attention. There is no need for you to explain nor apologize, Your Grace, her mother said quickly. Kitty watched as her father and the Duke shook hands. As he walked to his seat, there was another flutter in her stomach. Something unfamiliar stirred deep inside her as his gaze met hers again, but much to her dismay, his jaw clenched. Kitty was certain she noticed a flicker of disappointment in his eyes. Her heart sank. Would he reject her before they had even spoken? Your Grace, may I introduce my daughter, Lady Kitty Dunn, her father announced proudly. Kitty forced a smile to her face and leaned on the manners she'd been taught since the cradle. It is a pleasure to make your acquaintance, Your Grace. She bobbed a little curtsy, wondering if that was too much. No one seemed to mind, so she added, My parents have told me much about you. Indeed, my lady, the Duke answered noncommittally as he stood at the head of the table, waiting for them to be seated. Kitty sat, along with her parents, unease rippling over her skin. He wasn't very forthcoming with any sentiment whatsoever. Your estate is magnificent, Your Grace, Lady Dunn said with a warm smile. I've not seen anything quite like it before. The Duke glanced at Lady Dunn for a moment and nodded. This place has been in my family for generations, and I am determined to ensure it will continue to be the gem of Somerset, as it is often referred to. One can certainly see why. The gardens are beautiful. Lady Dunn sighed dreamily. The gardens were my father's pride and joy, God rest his soul. Lord and Lady Dunn nodded quietly, and a line of servants stepped out onto the terrace carrying trays of food for them all. Kitty felt the need to speak and assert something of herself into the moment, but she could not think of anything useful to say. She wished to know more about the enigmatic Duke, but a sudden shyness swallowed her words. Did you find your chambers well suited, Lady Kitty? the Duke asked suddenly. Indeed, thank you, Your Grace. It has a delightful view of the meadows, Kitty answered. I would love to see more of the estate if that suits Your Grace. I do so love the outdoors. Her mother shot her a quick frown. All in due time, my dear. Lady Dunn chuckled nervously and then turned to the Duke. My daughter is enamoured with being out of doors. It is the strangest thing. And why is that, my lady? Lord James asked. It is her father's influence as... My question was, in fact, directed at Lady Kitty, 
Lord James interjected. Kitty's jaw dropped. Not a soul on earth had ever dared to speak to her mother in such a manner. It was certainly bold, but also rather disrespectful. I beg your pardon, Your Grace. Lady Dunn's voice was soft as she reached for her teacup, but her glance at Kitty was full of warning. In contrast, the Duke's gaze was expectant as he stared at Kitty. She had not an inkling of the right thing to say. I am my father's only daughter, and child for that matter, Your Grace, and we have a very close-knit relationship. He taught me many things, and we share mutual interests, such as our love of nature and horses. Is that not rather improper for a young lady such as yourself? the Duke asked. Improper? Kitty narrowed her eyes at the impertinent man before her. Perhaps so, according to you and my mother, of course. But who are you to be so judgmental of a person without knowing her first, Your Grace? Beside her, Lady Dunn choked on her tea, and Kitty turned her icy stare away from the Duke and on to her mother. You should not drink so fast, mother. My sincerest apologies, Your Grace. My daughter. Your daughter clearly is not aware to whom she speaks, and in such a disrespectful manner as well. Lord Dunn, I was under the impression your daughter was polite and timid. Kitty glanced at the Duke incredulously. This was the man her father had arranged for her to marry. This arrogant, stilted jackanapes. Did he expect his future wife to sit around sewing or playing mournful tunes on a harpsichord or any of the other passive indoor pursuits that a quiet, timid young lady might pursue? For a moment, she teetered on the verge of jumping up and running across the meadow, but eventually common sense reared up and she bit back her annoyance. She lowered her gaze, doing her best to appear polite and timid. My sincerest apology, Your Grace. I meant no disrespect. The Duke stared at her as if unsure whether she was genuine. After a moment, his jaw eased and he nodded. Kitty spent the duration of the meal on the terrace in silence. She was annoyed with her parents and with the Duke, and was well aware that as soon as she stepped back into her bedchamber, she would be confronted by her mother. She had no desire to listen to her mother's haranguing regarding her behaviour, despite being aware she had actually been quite rude. At times, she felt as if she was a constant disappointment to her mother. In the past, her mother's attitude had seemed unjust, but now, she knew she would truly be a disappointment to her mother if she did anything to jeopardise the arrangement struck between her father and James. After all, she did not wish to be the one who caused ruination for her family. When they had all finished the meal, Kitty noticed the Duke glancing at her again, and she straightened her shoulders. The tension in the air was evident, and much to her relief, the Countess spoke first. Perhaps we should take a stroll through the gardens, to allow the Duke and Kitty to become better acquainted, Lady Dunn suggested. Or perhaps His Grace can show our dearest daughter the gardens. It is such a lovely day, Lord Dunn countered. But only if it pleases you, Your Grace. The Duke glanced briefly at Lord Dunn before turning his attention to Kitty. Indeed, it would suit me. After all, we are to be married and what better way to get to know one another than to take a simple stroll through the estate gardens? Especially when your future bride loves the outdoors. Kitty did not allow the sarcastic voice in her head to release. Instead, she gave herself a silent pat on the back for remaining silent. The Duke stood from his chair and held out his arm to her. She took it and allowed him to help her stand, then kept a hold of his arm while they slowly made their way to the stone steps that led down to the gardens. Behave, Kitty, her mother admonished. She tightened her lips. She had not expected her parents to allow her to take a stroll with the Duke without a chaperone, but she was certainly not about to question their decision. Perhaps he was known as such a stick in the mud that they knew there was nothing to be concerned about. 
As they descended the stairs, she glanced up at her companion, and despite his striking gaze, there was a softness present that somehow eased Kitty's churning feelings. She released her hold on his arm. This way, Lord James said simply, and Kitty followed him to a stone path which led to a large circular-shaped hedge. Your Grace, I wish to apologise properly for what I said. I did not mean to be so blunt and rude. Kitty was genuine in her remorse. I am not quite certain why I said what I did. And yet you did, even though it was the first time we have met. It was a momentary lapse of judgment, but if I may be so bold as to say, you were rather oafish yourself, Your Grace. Kitty was not about to let him off the hook that easily. He immediately bristled. I am the Duke of Somerset and a Seymour. We are one of the wealthiest families in the county, if not England. Surely my title and position must engender a certain level of respect. Neither power nor money can engender respect, Your Grace, Kitty pointed out. Respect is something to be earned. With all due respect to you and your family. The Duke stared at her. I must admit, my lady, you are not what I imagined you would be. I will graciously accept that compliment, Kitty answered. It was not intended as such. I know. That is why I will accept it. As a compliment. Because anything else would be an unforgivable insult, would it not? Kitty hardly knew what she meant, but at the same time, she enjoyed the look of confusion on the Duke's face. The man was in need of someone who could stand up to his supreme sense of self-worth. She lowered her gaze immediately after speaking. Did she really have to endure this man for the rest of her life? Although Kitty could not deny the Duke was handsome, a pleasant appearance certainly did not mask arrogance or an inconsiderate nature, and so far it seemed that he had both. I am who I am, Your Grace, she said at last, when he didn't speak. Despite my mother wishing I were a different person, I cannot change who I am without betraying myself. There was a long, drawn-out pause before he answered. To thine own self be true. Kitty blinked, surprised by his response. Indeed. What is your favourite thing to do, my lady? James inquired. As strange and unladylike as it may seem to your grace, I spend much of my time at my father's stable. James's shocked expression was one she'd come to expect from people. Undeterred, she continued. I adore horses, even from a very young age. I was five years old when my father taught me to ride, and I have loved it ever since. Kitty sighed dreamily, but soon realised how foolish she sounded. Or was it that she only felt foolish in the presence of the Duke of Somerset? Lord James was a sophisticated man with mature thoughts, and her own words seemed rather juvenile in comparison. As a member of such an important and influential family, and having such an esteemed title, the Duke had been forced into a world where he could not enjoy the things he loved and had to fulfil his family's destiny as best he could. She suddenly wondered what his favourite activity might be. I have a stable full of fine steppers, he said, out of the blue. You do, Your Grace? With the property of this size, Kitty had assumed he would have stables and horses. However, she hadn't been sure if he would share such knowledge with her. Indeed. I have many horses in my stable, but I rarely get the opportunity to ride them. But you do ride? Kitty couldn't contain a tiny, hopeful smile. Most likely not as well as you do, my lady. There was a decidedly friendly tone in the statement, almost as though he were teasing her. She shrugged, trying to hide the confusion his teasing created within her. May I ask a question, Your Grace? Of course. Would you perhaps take me there, to your stable? It would mean the world to me to visit your horses. James nodded. 
Of course, my lady. This way. A wide and genuine smile formed on Kitty's face for the first time since her arrival at Woodlock Manor, and for a moment she thought she saw an answering smile on the Duke's face as well. Chapter 4 When James told Lady Kitty she was not what he had imagined, he meant every word. The manner in which Lord Dunn had described his daughter was somewhat deceiving, and he had failed to mention her love for horses. It was rather curious behaviour for a young lady. Most ladies of the ton he'd met enjoyed only indoor activities and would never be seen in the company of what they perceived as filthy animals. Those ladies would much rather have tea in the parlour and speak of their dreams of becoming a wife to a nobleman and a mother to his heirs. They wore exquisite gowns and spoke only when spoken to. Not this young lady. Her beauty was undeniable, her black hair and bright blue eyes were utterly spectacular. She also had a dimple in her right cheek when she smiled, which made happiness curl inside his chest. But Kitty was unlike anyone he had ever met. He'd expected a proper and decorous young lady who would listen to his every word, whether she really wished to or not. But instead, here was Kitty, whose unconventional nature threatened to enthrall him. If only she weren't so beautiful. He did not wish to complicate this already burdensome arrangement by falling in love, but the unfamiliar feelings that bubbled to the surface inside him every time Kitty glanced in his direction told him he was in trouble. Especially since she had smiled so genuinely when he told her he would escort her to his stable. Ever since his father's sudden death, James had learned that it was expected of him to be the stoic and responsible son who would step up and fill his father's shoes. He had been forced to suppress his feelings, regardless of what was going on around him. His father's shoes were rather intimidating to fill, but James had no other choice. Nevertheless, finding a wife had not been high on his list of priorities. Now that Kitty was beside him, her blue eyes sparkling happily as the stable came into view, he wasn't sure how to process what he felt. Her excitement was rather contagious. My father did not mention you had a stable, Kitty pointed out. But knowing my mother, she most certainly was the one who convinced him not to say anything. Mother believes young women should not be on horses, or in stables, or even outside at all. It is not fitting for a young lady who is of marriageable age. Lady Dunn is right to some extent. Most ladies would not be seen anywhere near such a place. However, the fact that you enjoy such things does not make you less refined, in my opinion. It pleases me to hear you say this, Your Grace, Kitty said. I would not wish to give you more reason to disapprove of me. James glanced at her, and his brow furrowed. What on earth makes you say such a thing, my lady? You suggested I was improper and unladylike at breakfast, she reminded him tartly. The Duke's cheeks heated. I was simply surprised by the conversation, that is all, he said. I did not mean to give offence. Kitty studied him. Pardon my candour, Your Grace, but I am not oblivious to the situation in which we both find ourselves. This is merely a business arrangement and nothing more. Perhaps, though, you can attempt to control your facial expressions to hide the apparent disgust and disapproval you have while gazing upon me. He ducked his head, willing his cheeks to cool down. My sincerest apologies, my lady. This beautiful and utterly frank young lady who walked beside him clearly did not understand why his visage carried a look of disapproval, but it was not the sight of her, nor anything about her, that had disappointed him. It was the innocence and abundance of life that danced in her bright blue eyes that disheartened him. It was highly likely the young beauty had dreams of falling in love and being loved in return, which he knew he would not be able to reciprocate. Of course, 
James could not reveal this to Kitty without seeming weak and vulnerable, and the men of the Seymour name were neither of those traits. For now, if Kitty was under the impression he disapproved of her, then so be it. He could not offer any more at this time. The pair reached the stable without exchanging any more words, but, as James pushed open the large wooden door of the stable, Kitty's jaw dropped and her eyes sparkled even brighter than before. The large barn housed at least fifteen magnificent horses. Their coats shone with vitality and their muscles were well developed. It was obvious they were well fed, groomed regularly and exercised daily. The stalls were filled with clean, fluffy straw that had its own unique aroma, which confirmed they were mucked out more than once a day. The cobblestone floor was swept clean, and in the corner, James noticed two grooms chatting while they polished horse tack. The soft sounds of horses rose around them as James led Kitty down the aisleway, a small smile forming on his lips as he watched her with the animals. She slowly approached each one, stroking its muzzle lovingly and whispering softly, her words inaudible to James. It did not, however, matter what she spoke, as he was fully aware from the positive response of each beast that her words must be gentle and kind, filled with affection and endearments. As James stood silently watching her, a beam of sunlight shone through the wooden panels above them, brilliantly highlighting her face and hair. James's chest tightened, and his breath was stolen from his throat, not only by her beauty, but in the gentle, almost maternal, manner in which she spoke to a bay gelding. She gracefully moved to the next stall, doing the same to the Palomino stallion. Her gaze moved downward, and she turned to James with a furrowed brow. Your Grace, Kitty said. James's brow rose, and, as she glanced expectantly at him, he approached her. Yes, my lady. This stallion is ill. I beg your pardon, my lady, James inquired. Look, Kitty said, and pointed to the horse's coat. His coat is dull, and so are his eyes. He has not eaten any of his hay, and he seems rather lethargic. James narrowed his gaze taking in everything she had said. You are very perceptive, my lady. Why hadn't his grooms noticed the same thing? You should have an animal doctor come and attend this horse, your grace, Kitty insisted. I will have one of the grooms summon him. I promise you that, my lady. Thank you, your grace, Kitty answered gratefully, slowly stroking the horse's muzzle. My father taught me everything he knows about horses when they are happy and thriving, and when they are ill. We have lost a few in my lifetime, each one's death sadder than the previous. I loved those horses, each and every one of them. I see it in your eyes, my lady, James said, and Kitty turned to him. The manner in which you speak to the animals, and the manner in which you approach them, you do it so elegantly and full of grace. It is truly admirable. Kitty smiled sincerely and nodded. Thank you, Your Grace. Your words are kind. Kinder than I expected they would be. I believe you may be labouring under a misconception about me, James said, unwilling to let her go on believing him indifferent. And what precisely would that misconception be, Your Grace? He'd never had to explain his personality nor his manners before, and he struggled to draw the correct words into his mind. He swallowed hard. My father was a stern man who did not take kindly to those who opposed him, or those who did not fit into the parameters he had been taught to believe were right. Your father would not have approved of our betrothal? Kitty asked. That is not what I was insinuating, my lady. Tell me then, your grace, Kitty insisted, her jaw tightening in a determined way. For a very long time I agreed with my father, even after his death. There was a proper way for people to behave, and there was an improper way. James had idolised his father and done everything in his power 
to uphold the standards that had been set for him. Do you still agree with his way of thinking, Your Grace? Kitty asked, cocking her head and waiting as if she genuinely wanted to know his answer. Perhaps not completely, but still to an extent, James answered, compelled by her interest to present the truth. Shall we return to the terrace? I don't wish for your parents to think I have abducted you. Kitty nodded with a perfect smile lifting her rosy lips. They would be delighted, in all honesty. James chuckled at her dry tone as they left the stable and stepped out into the crisp late morning air. The sky was still blue, contrasted now by puffy white clouds drifting overhead. Kitty's blue eyes shone even brighter than they had before, and James could not tear his gaze from her. Is something wrong, Your Grace? Kitty inquired. There is quite a peculiar expression on your face. I was merely thinking of something. James shrugged and turned away from her inquisitive gaze. This might seem very unorthodox, my lady, but perhaps we could go riding together. The meadows are beautiful this time of year. Do you enjoy riding, Your Grace? I would not like to impose on your indoor activities, Kitty answered coyly. A grin formed on James's lips before he could help himself. To be entirely truthful, I have not ridden a horse in a long while. Since my father passed, there has been no time. I was immediately given my father's title as my inheritance, along with the duties that accompanied it. I was forced to sign documents and attend meetings about subjects of which I knew little. My father had been at my side constantly when he was alive, but he never truly taught me how to function without him. It has been rather a difficult period. James cleared his throat. He couldn't believe he had just admitted that to a near stranger. At times it still is, he finished quietly. Kitty's gaze dropped. My condolences for your loss, Your Grace. I cannot begin to fathom what you must have been through, but I do know that you have more strength than you realize. James stared at Kitty, whose eyes lured him in an intimate gaze that he wanted to pursue, but knew he must not. I would love to go riding across the meadows with you, Kitty said softly, then stepped back. A mischievous smile formed on her lips. Perhaps I could interest you in a race as well. A race? Do not be ridiculous, my lady. James scoffed. Even with his rusty riding skills, surely she could not expect to outride a duke on his own lands. Are you afraid you might lose, Your Grace? Kitty challenged. Or are you merely not up for a challenge? Neither, James said firmly. I simply do not wish to embarrass you. Kitty chuckled and shook her head. Your confidence is amusing and enlightening, but I do believe I may win this challenge. Fine, then. We shall certainly see, James said, as he held out his arm to assist her up the stairs that led to the terrace. Tomorrow, at dawn. Meet me by the stable. Wonderful. Kitty beamed and placed her small hand in the crook of his arm to ascend the stairs. I hope your parents do not scold you for agreeing to my challenge, James stated. In all fairness, I was the one who challenged you, Your Grace. And sadly, it will probably not come as a surprise to my family, nor will they think any less of you for accepting, Kitty clarified. Do not feel one shred of remorse, Your Grace. I am fully capable of handling my mother. And father, too. You should concentrate on fretting over the coming race. Her sly smile and the excitement in her eyes lifted his spirits in a way that hadn't happened in far too long. Then it is agreed. The stable at dawn. James placed his hand on his heart as if swearing an oath. I look forward to it. As do I. Kitty nodded with a smile before she turned away and entered through the doors into the great hall.
Chapter 5 Kitty drifted on a cloud as she made her way through the Great Hall and almost didn't notice her parents at the far end of the space, studying the paintings on the walls. She had not previously noticed the portraits and paintings that hung from the walls and slowly gazed at each as she made her way across to her mother and father. There were small descriptions beneath each portrait explaining who the subjects were and she realised for the first time that the Duke had siblings, a brother and sister. The family resemblance among them all was quite remarkable. The Duke's sister appeared to be a beautiful young woman whose eyes definitely resembled James. While the brother seemed taller and more lean than Lord James, there was a similar cast to the features that marked them as Seymour siblings. The short while she had spent in the stable with the Duke had certainly warmed her toward him, and she was under the impression he had become more intrigued and interested in her, too. The manner in which he now glanced at her was different, though he still seemed to want distance between them, for a reason she could not fathom. It seemed to Kitty that he still thought of their arrangement as purely business. Perhaps leaving sentiment out of the deal was the best way for him to handle the situation at present, since he had mentioned he was not used to young ladies such as herself. She stopped before a large portrait of the Duke, pursing her lips as she studied his serious countenance. So different to the softening of his features when he deigned to smile or laugh. A strange feeling crept inside her. What would the Duke's lips taste like? And how would it feel to have his hand caress her cheek? Her heart began to pound, and her cheeks heated as she lowered her gaze to the floor. Her father noticed her then. My dear child! Kitty took a deep breath, composed herself, and approached her parents. Mother! Father! I hope you do not mind, but the Duke and I... Her voice trailed off as she glanced behind her but there was no trace of anyone else. A small part of her had hoped he would accompany her inside, but to no avail. She glanced back at her parents, who stood quietly waiting. His Grace and I visited his stable. The horses were lovely. Kitty beamed, but immediately noticed her mother's disapproving scowl. He offered to take me riding in the meadow at dawn tomorrow. I am certain you do not have any objections to this, as you wish for the Duke and I to become better acquainted and more familiar with each other. Lord and Lady Dunn glanced at each other, but the Countess did not utter a word. Father? Kitty asked. Of course we approve, he answered at last, and Kitty raised her brow apprehensively. She was well aware her mother was embarrassed at the notion of her daughter taking a ride in the meadow, but at least it pointed to the Duke's interest in her. I promised to be on my best behaviour, mother. After all, the Duke would not have offered if he was opposed to spending time together, would he? Kitty pointed out. Indeed, and for that we are truly blessed and grateful. Lady Dunn breathed a sigh of apparent relief, but her lips were still tight, indicating her reluctance to fully support the excursion at dawn. You will require a chaperone, of course. Perhaps I could have him ask one of the grooms to ride with us. I am well aware of how much Mother dislikes horses, and I would not wish for you to feel abandoned in such a large and spacious estate, Kitty suggested, as she glanced at Lord Dunn for his thoughts. That is a splendid idea, my dear, her father answered. Then her mother piped up. Your father can keep me company while you frolic in the wilderness with your betrothed. It is hardly frolicking, mother. We will simply be riding the Duke's horses through the meadow. No wilderness, Kitty corrected, but her cheeks heated at the mere thought of being alone with James when no one could catch sight of them. A sudden burst of flutters spiralled inside her stomach. Would it be so very wrong to experience a kiss from your betrothed? Perhaps there might be a chance for her to taste the Duke's lips and feel the heat of his body against hers as they watched the sunrise set the sky alight in flames of reds and oranges. Her daydream, however, was rudely and very prematurely interrupted 
by the realisation that they would be accompanied by a groom. Perhaps another occasion would arise when she could realise the strange fantasy that seemed to be taking over her thoughts. Mother, may I read for a while in my chambers? Kitty asked, clasping her hands together in front of her. Certainly, my dear. The Duke has not informed us what he has planned for this afternoon, but as soon as he does, I may call upon you to join us. We would not wish you to miss any time with your betrothed. Of course not, mother, Kitty answered. As she turned and made her way to the main staircase, her mind whirled. She had no intention of reading demurely in her chambers. Instead, she would find her journal and write of all the feelings that currently bubbled up inside her. The excitement she felt in anticipation for tomorrow's race with the Duke was proving impossible to tamp down. The previous feelings of dread had been replaced by hope that the Duke was not, in fact, such a terrible match after all. Arranged marriage or not, she suddenly could not wait to see what the future might bring. She ascended the staircase and reached the top, practically skipping to her bedchamber. Once inside, she glanced around happily, but her smile soon disappeared. The trunk with her books, as well as her journal, was not in her bedchamber. It may have been misplaced and taken to her mother and father's room instead. She hurried out the door and quietly opened the door of the suite beside hers, stepping inside with some trepidation. She was not usually permitted in her mother and father's chambers without their knowledge, as it infringed on their privacy rules at home. Much to her delight, she noticed her small chest immediately and retrieved it from the corner. Perhaps in all the excitement, her mother had forgotten to inform her that it had ended up with their things. As she made her way to the door, a letter caught her eye. It was lying on the bed, half concealed by a lace-covered pillow. It seemed out of place somehow, as if someone had tried their utmost to hide it in a hurry. Kitty stood for a moment, torn, but the temptation was too great to resist, and she reached for the letter. Much to her shock and disbelief, it was addressed to herself, with her father's estate address penned below her name. Her heart sank as she opened the letter and read the words that had obviously been hidden from her by her parents. My dearest Kitty, it has been many years since we have seen one another, and even longer since we spoke. Ten years to be exact, but it truly feels like a lifetime. A lifetime I spent without the sun in my days and the moon in my nights. I hope you remember the days we shared at the river where we would play. I still remember your exuberant laugh and the way the sunlight danced in your eyes. I remember the fields of wildflowers and how we ran through them, carefree and filled with happiness. The way life ought to have been before all the terrible things happened that split us apart. I have spent many nights wondering whether you thought of me or even missed me. It was a very unpleasant time for me. Not only did I lose my mother, but I also lost the one person who meant the world to me. You, Kitty. I have spent the past ten years searching and yearning for someone who would take my breath away in the manner in which you did, but none have come close. I have loved and adored you from the moment I saw you all those years ago. It was a moment I could never forget. I still think of you every time I see a yellow flower or smell the aroma of freshly baked bread. I hope you have not forgotten about me. Sincerely yours, Edward Walsh. Kitty lowered the letter, her jaw slack after reading the words meant for her eyes alone. Edward Walsh, who was most certainly the Marquess of Wyndham by now, had been her childhood friend for many years, until his mother passed and his father remarried. Soon after his second marriage, Edward's father relocated the whole family to the north, and despite writing one another letters, their friendship had faded over time. Kitty recalled the times Edward spoke of, including their excursions to the river and the fields through which they had run. 
She had known the young lord since she was five years of age, and their friendship was the one thing she had once treasured more than her horses. Tears blurred her vision as she lowered the letter written with Edward's perfect penmanship. Why would her mother have the letter in her possession? And why had she thought it appropriate to hide it from Kitty? As she turned, she saw her mother standing in the doorway. You kept this from me! Kitty's voice was raw and hoarse, filled with heartbreak. I had no choice, my dear, Lady Dunn answered. What does that even mean? Kitty said, her heart thumping harder against her ribs as she struggled to keep from shouting. How long have you had this? Does it matter? Kitty gasped, swallowing hard against the lump that rose in her throat. Of course it matters! I missed him every second he was gone. How dare you keep such a thing from me, mother? How could her mother not understand how she felt? I did it for your own good, Kitty, her mother answered, and stepped inside, closing the door of the bedchamber behind her. Can you imagine what his grace would think if he were to find out about this? He would most certainly not follow through with the marriage, knowing that another man longs for his betrothed. That was not your decision to make, mother, Kitty argued. It most certainly was, Lady Dunn hissed and approached Kitty. You are well aware of what is at stake. This marriage with the Duke must happen for the sake of our family's survival. Do you wish me to work as a seamstress with our home gone and our fine belongings sold at auction? Why did everything always come back to this same argument? And why was it all on Kitty's shoulders? Mother, please dispense with the drama. It is not theatrics, Kitty. This is our life, our future, and that letter puts everything we have worked for at risk. I will most certainly not allow that to happen under any circumstances. Lady Dunn snatched the letter from Kitty's hand. Mother, I will not allow this to affect your father's arrangement with the Duke, and neither should you allow this to have any effect on you, her mother hissed once more. With her mother like this, it was pointless to even begin to attempt any form of defiance. Her mother's mind had been made up, and that was the end of it. Kitty knew her thoughts or opinions on the matter did not count. She left her mother's chambers without another word and without her precious letter. Chapter 6 James glanced down at the book resting in his hands. His brow furrowed deeply as he considered his own actions and wondered at the motivation behind them. He'd just spent the better part of the morning and afternoon in the library reading about horses and how to properly ride them to refresh his memory. He told himself it was because he wanted to improve his chances of winning the race he had arranged with Kitty, but he had the feeling he didn't stand a chance of victory, no matter how many books he read. Kitty had been riding most of her life, and she had even recognised the signs of an ill horse when he and his own grooms had not, which meant he was likely doomed come dawn tomorrow. In a sudden explosion of sound that cut through the silence in which he'd immersed himself, the doors of the library burst open and William entered in a rush. James stared at him over the top of his book. What the devil! Our sister has lost her mind, William announced, with great theatrics and exaggerated arm movements. James simply gazed at him for a moment before rolling his eyes. That is not exactly news, William. You don't understand, James. This is rather serious. It always is, James said, and returned his attention to the book. What on earth are you reading? William asked as he approached. Equestrian etiquette? Good Lord! You are as crazy as Elizabeth. I do not appreciate that comparison, William, Lizzie said with a distinct tone of disgust in her voice as she entered the library as well. 
so much for my peace and quiet, thought James. I speak only the truth, William countered. Lizzie rolled her eyes. You wouldn't know the truth if it landed a facer on your chin. You are a fine one to speak, sister. Oh, go ring a peal over someone else. I am not in the mood, Lizzie said. James, who realised his solitude was now well and truly gone, snapped shut the book and placed it on the table to his left before standing up to face his siblings. What are you two arguing about? I saw Elizabeth engage in a rather intimate conversation with Lord Dorset, William answered. James glanced at Lizzie and raised a brow. Sister? She scowled and crossed her arms. It was not an intimate conversation, she insisted. He was standing rather close to you, Elizabeth, and his hand coincidentally brushed your arm and shoulder on more than one occasion, William scoffed. I saw it with my own eyes, as did others, I might add. Purely unintentional, I assure you, Lizzie said, and glanced through her lashes at James. He narrowed his eyes. There was more than a little guilt in Lizzie's expression. It was time to step in. Lord Dorset is known for being a rake, sister. I wouldn't want you to be associated with a man like him, James pointed out. Precisely what I told her, William said. She certainly does not listen when I speak. Lizzie sighed in obvious annoyance and shook her head. James, William is blowing this entirely out of proportion. Lord Dorset is a charming man who... Who will ruin you without a moment's hesitation, and then we will be stuck looking after you when you become an unmarriageable social outcast, William exclaimed. That is quite enough, William, James said sharply. You do not speak to our sister in such a disrespectful manner, no matter what the circumstances. Thank you, dearest James, Lizzie pouted. But, James said, and turned to Lizzie. William does indeed make a valid point. Lord Dorset is notorious for being a rake. He has ruined the reputation of many young women. Possibly, Lizzie interrupted. Or possibly not. James, you and I are aware of how rumours can rage out of control. Need I remind you of the rumour of you and Lady Whitmore? There is no need to bring that up, James interjected. Precisely. The rumour mill churns out all kinds of untruths. Perhaps Lord Dorset is not as infamous as he is said to be, Lizzie pointed out. Are you willing to take such a chance? James inquired. Are you willing to stake your reputation, your future, the Seymour name, on chance alone? A few moments of silence filled the library, but the silence had an edge that it had not had prior to his siblings' arrival. Lizzie inhaled deeply and approached James. She cocked her head as she saw the book's title, but did not mention anything about the subject matter. She turned to face her brothers. I understand you both feel the need to protect me, and I am flattered that you would go to such extremes, but I am a grown woman. I can make my own decisions, especially ones related to men. You see, that is where you are wrong, sister. William shook his head and glanced at James. Tell her. If there was one thing James despised more than anything, it was being thrown into the middle of his siblings' incessant arguments as the mediator. As the eldest, he was often forced to choose sides, and he'd had enough. James wished for his brother and sister to have the best in life and to make sound decisions, but he could not force them to choose differently, nor negate their opinions as invalid or unimportant. At most times, his sister was not the rebellious one. That role usually lay with William. This time, though, he had to admit that her defence of Dorset was not a sound decision at all. Lord Dorset was indeed a rake, and the tales that had spread through the county were not mere rumours. 
James had heard stories firsthand, many from the Marquess himself. It was not something to boast about, but Lord Dorset possessed not even an inkling of remorse for what he had done to the many women who had fallen for his charming ways. There had been several occasions at their gentleman's club in town where James was forced to hold his tongue while listening to Lord Dorset boast of his exploits. When it came to his sister, that was an entirely different matter altogether. I can see in your eyes, sister, that you have already made up your mind about the man's innocence, James finally answered, speaking slowly to allow Lizzie to fully grasp his words. But you are wrong. I personally have heard him speak of his many exploits, and without any sign of remorse either. It is only natural for William and I, as your brothers, to caution you with regards to Lord Dorset. He is a notorious rake. People can change. William groaned, and James rubbed his eyes wearily, holding in the exasperated growl that threatened to erupt from his throat. I would not wish any harm upon you from his hand, or anyone else's for that matter. Understand, sister, that William and I are doing our best to look after your well-being. Lizzie's eyes softened, and she approached James, taking his hands in hers. I value your opinion most in this world, James, and I love you with all my heart. I understand that you are concerned about me, as you are too, William, and I cannot express how appreciative I am. But my choices are still mine, and I am mature enough to deal with the consequences. Knowing you are here for me when I need you is enough. More than enough. William stepped forward, still huffing. If he touches a single hair on... He will, William, Lizzie said, as she turned to him, releasing James's hand. And I will more than likely allow him to do many more things to me, but that is for me to decide, not you. Is that clear? James exchanged a worried glance with William, but instead of uttering anything that might lead to another rift, or even cause Lizzie to rebel further, he turned to his sister. As clear as the bright blue sky, sister. They all involuntarily looked out the window, and a small chuckle emanated from Lizzie at the sight of scudding clouds. Hmm, she said primly, but a satisfied smile formed on her lips, and she nodded at James. Now, tell us, why on earth were you reading a book on equestrian etiquette? James glanced down at the book and shrugged his shoulders, trying to hide his sudden embarrassment. A bit of light reading. I hardly find that believable. Lizzie scoffed. Why the sudden interest? Perhaps it has something to do with his new wife, William suggested. A twinkle of intrigue appeared in Lizzie's eyes. Of course. Tell us everything. There is not much to say, Elizabeth. Nonsense, James. You have clearly gone to great lengths to read up about a subject in which she must be interested. Is that usually a good sign, William? Lizzie inquired. Either that, or James simply wishes to sharpen his equestrian knowledge, William answered. Though why now, today, and only after meeting a certain young lady? All right, all right. James folded his arms across his chest, unaccountably agitated by the attention on his love life. He was well aware that resistance was futile, and his siblings, especially Lizzie, would not leave him be until he answered honestly. Lady Kitty adores horses, and her father taught her everything he knows about them. How to care for them, how to ride them, everything. I offered to take her for a ride in the meadow tomorrow at dawn, and I thought it would be prudent to read through the books here in the library in order to not seem, uh, inadequate, William shot at him. Lizzie cocked her head. Your knowledge of horses is rather questionable, James. You do not even like them. James couldn't stop the sigh that emerged. I don't hate them, Elizabeth. Her brows rose, but before she could speak, William jumped in. 
Clearly it does not matter whether James likes horses or not. He grinned. Look at him, Lizzie. He is practically changing himself for this woman. Lizzie smiled sweetly. Is it true, James? Have you fallen in love already? Did you fall in love with Kitty the instant the two of you met? Don't be ridiculous. James felt the heat rise in his cheeks, and he shifted uncomfortably from one foot to the other. Tell me truthfully, James. Is she beautiful? Lizzie inquired. Another sigh escaped, and he couldn't lie. Not to his sister. More beautiful than I ever imagined she would be, James answered. But it is more than that. Kitty is unlike any other woman I've ever met. She is not afraid to be herself. She speaks her mind, and even though she tries very hard to please her mother and father, she is still true to herself. Also, she is witty and kind. Elizabeth, you should have seen the manner in which she spoke to the horses. Soft and caring, maternal even. Lizzie and William exchanged intrigued glances that James tried hard to ignore, and then Lizzie chuckled. It seems as though our brother might be marrying for love after all, William. Lizzie's words resonated in his mind. Was it true? Had he fallen for Lady Kitty Dunn at first meeting? Even though he knew it was unlikely that Kitty would reciprocate such feelings at this stage, he felt hope fill his chest. Hope. And love. At least Kitty would know what life would be like being married to a man who loved her. Chapter 7 As she had done the previous morning, Kitty woke before dawn. But on this day, excitement flowed through her veins instead of dread. She stood in front of the mirror studying her reflection and bit her lip in worry. Yesterday, the Duke had met her when she was dressed in a beautiful gown, her hair clean and perfectly braided and pinned on the crown of her head. Today she was dressed in a pale green riding habit, and because she had dressed herself, instead of making one of the maidservants attend to her so early, her hair was gathered in a simple bun at her nape. While she knew the Duke was intrigued by more than merely her attractive features, Kitty certainly hoped he would not think any less of her. Admittedly, she was also filled with excitement for the coming horse race, as well as their more gentle ride across the meadows. She had not informed her mother and father of the race, as her mother would not have allowed such a thing to go ahead. Kitty had promised her parents she would be on her best behaviour, and of course she would behave, but what they were not aware of would not harm them. She took one last glance at her reflection and nodded to herself in encouragement before she snuck out of her bedchamber. The hallways were still dark, the thick drapes tightly closed, smothering out any signs of daylight, allowing the guests to enjoy their peaceful slumber as long as they wished. Kitty passed the paintings in the hallways, excitement manifesting in a large grin. She passed several servants, greeting them happily until she descended the main stairwell. The great hall was ominously dark as she passed through it, the eyes of the portraits hanging there following her eerily. Kitty did not, however, allow the creepy paintings to deter her from her goal. A maidservant noticed her approach the door to the terrace and hurriedly ran to open it for Kitty. Have a pleasant ride, my lady. The meadow is beautiful this time of the year. Thank you, I will indeed, Kitty answered. She stepped out onto the terrace and made her way down the stone steps to her right. Somehow, she'd been under the impression the Duke would not inform anyone who worked at the estate of their whereabouts. But upon further consideration, she came to the realisation that James would have had to inform everyone for his own safety and hers. Woodlock Manor was his estate, his home, and he did not appear to keep any secrets. He spoke candidly regarding his father and how he had been raised. It pleased Kitty to see his openness extend toward her so easily. He had certainly warmed up in a most unexpected manner after those first few minutes at the breakfast table. 
When her parents had informed her of the arrangement that had been struck with James of Somerset, she had been devastated at the thought of being forced into a marriage she did not want. But when her father explained the terrible financial situation in which their family found themselves, she had reluctantly agreed. She did not wish to defy her parents and cause her family's ruination. Kitty still had an obligation to her parents, and she was well aware that the fate of her family now rested on her shoulders. She did not have any siblings with whom this responsibility could be shared, hence the only way to ensure her family's survival was to marry a wealthy, entitled man. For the first time, Kitty found herself hopeful about the future. Marriage to Lord James might not be as terrible as she had imagined. As Kitty followed the path that led to the stable, she noticed three horses standing outside with saddles on their backs and their reins in place. The groom who was to accompany them stepped out of the barn, followed by the duke. The moment Kitty gazed upon James, her heart pounded in her chest, and time slowed down. The duke immediately noticed her approach and turned to her with a small smile. Your Grace, she said, her voice slightly breathless. A good morning to you, my lady. You look absolutely radiant, the duke greeted her. Your words flatter me, Your Grace, Kitty said, lowering her gaze in a futile attempt to hide her heated cheeks. I speak only the truth, my lady, James said. Are you ready? Kitty glanced at the Duke and noticed his outstretched hand. Perhaps it is more appropriate if I ask you that question, Your Grace, she answered with a sly chuckle. Your confidence is admirable. The Duke laughed in return as Kitty placed her hand in his. James led her to the snow-white stallion that stood a short distance from them, beside a chestnut that she assumed was meant for him. Your horses are beautiful, Your Grace. He settled Kitty onto the side saddle on the white horse before the groom gave the Duke a leg up onto the chestnut. Within a short while, they made their way in the direction of the large meadow. Kitty adored the feeling of being on the graceful and majestic white stallion's back, her body moving up and down and learning the creature's gait as he trotted through the tall grass. It had been too long since she had been able to ride her horses, which sadly were no longer in her father's possession. As soon as the news came to light with regards to his business partner and the scoundrel's theft of finances from the company, Lord Dunn was forced to sell off many of their assets which unfortunately had included the horses. Of course, Kitty had been devastated, but she understood the necessity. This was why it was important for her to make certain her union with the Duke went smoothly. Although it would not bring her beloved horses back, it would most certainly ensure that her father did not lose his estate as well as his business. Her father had, in Kitty's opinion, already lost enough. She gazed at the sky as the sunrise illuminated the area in a warm glow and a shiver of delight ran down her spine. The meadow was extraordinary and the man riding his horse beside her was even more so. She could tell he was perhaps a little rusty in the art of horse riding, but overall he had an excellent level of skill. His hand was light on the reins, which meant a lot to her, as she could not abide those who treated their mounts with heavy-handed disrespect. The light fell on James's face, accentuating his features, and Kitty could not help but stare at him longer than usual. His dark hair blew softly in the fresh breeze, and his shoulders were relaxed as he gazed out across the landscape before them. The meadow is beautiful, Your Grace. I have not seen anything like it in my entire life. Not even riding the countryside with my father, Kitty said. It is quite beautiful, he said. I have not been out here at the meadow for a long while. I will have to remedy that in future. Other matters required your undivided attention, Kitty said with a nod. Thank you for bringing me here. It is calming and relaxing. A welcome break from the bustle and ruckus of the manor. If you are referring to your parents, James said with a grin, I could not agree with you more, my lady. 
and it is my utmost pleasure. Kitty chuckled in amusement and glanced at James. You and I should do this more often, Your Grace. James glanced at her with a furrowed brow, and she pursed her lips briefly before blurting out, When we are married, this could become a new family tradition, perhaps. The thought of spending the rest of her life with James was now more than palatable. When he did not respond, she lowered her gaze. Had she pushed too far? I understand if you do not wish to do that, Your Grace. It is, after all, simply a business arrangement between you and my father. Is that what you think, my lady? James asked. It does not matter what I think, Your Grace. It is the truth, is it not? Kitty asked. You had not met me before yesterday. You do not know nearly enough about me to fully support this marriage on any basis other than a mutually beneficial business arrangement. My lady, just because we only just met does not mean... Kitty waved her hand. You do not need to make excuses, Your Grace. I am aware of the situation, and I accept it. You misunderstand, my lady. Yes, this is an arrangement forged between myself and your father. But until I met you, I wasn't. What I mean to say is... James coughed and then sighed. My lady, what I'm trying to say is that once we met, any doubts I might have had about the situation just melted away. If this wasn't what I wanted, I would not have gone through with it, he said. Kitty's brow furrowed. How can you say such a thing, Your Grace? You barely know me. But that which I do know of you, my lady, appeals to me very much, the Duke pointed out. And what precisely do you know? Kitty asked, allowing a shy smile to escape. Your ferocity, the manner in which you stay true to yourself, regardless of what others may say the love you have in your heart toward the things that make you truly happy. Your obvious kindness toward others, James answered. Kitty's knees weakened, and she was infinitely grateful she was not standing, as she may have fallen on her face. Your words are very kind, Your Grace. They are true, my lady. The Duke smiled at her, the corners of his eyes crinkling in a very enticing manner. Kitty reciprocated the smile until hers turned into a sly smirk. Perhaps it is time you and I prepare for that race you proposed. As I recall, it was... His voice trailed off. Perhaps we should. Kitty chuckled and steadied her horse. She had great faith in this wonderful white beast. Shall we race to the top of that hill in the distance? The Duke glanced in the direction Kitty motioned and nodded. Very well. And whoever is the winner? Kitty brought her hand up to her chin and pondered for a moment. What sort of prize would be worth having? The winner can decide a suitable punishment for the other, in a manner of speaking. It can be anything he or she wishes, the Duke suggested. Kitty found his suggestion intriguing and rather appealing so she nodded. That is an excellent suggestion, Your Grace. I thank you, my lady. The Duke seemed slightly nervous as Kitty positioned her stallion beside his, and she glanced across at him. He was fidgeting with his reins. Is everything well, Your Grace? Indeed. Why do you ask? Kitty shrugged her shoulders. You seem nervous. Nonsense. Then he seemed to relent. It has merely been some time since I rode a horse, let alone raced with an opponent, he admitted. I can understand that, but in order to preserve my honour, please do not allow me to win. I do not feel that would be in any manner a compliment, Kitty felt compelled to say. Just in case you were considering that option. Understood, my lady. The Duke nodded. Excellent. Are you ready? As ready as I will ever be. The Duke looked at the groom waiting on a smaller horse nearby. Shall you see us off, Kenneth? 
It would be my pleasure, Your Grace, the young groom answered. Three, two, one, go. Chapter 8 The moment Kenneth gave the signal, Kitty took off, and James realised he stood no chance against her. She would win the race on her own merits, and not because he allowed it. Instead of focusing fully on guiding his horse toward the hilltop finish line, he kept watching Kitty far more than he should have. A few moments after they started, her long onyx hair somehow became undone from its neat confines and blew in the wind behind her like an amazing velvet cape. The vision seemed to free her from the societal norms he had been accustomed to, giving him goosebumps and shivers of delight as he watched her. James's horse started to fall further behind, and he shook the reins and urged the animal on with a gentle nudge in the flanks. Soon the chestnut stallion caught up to Kitty's horse, and they raced side by side along the meadow through the tall grass. James could not recall the last time he had felt such freedom in his soul. The wind rushed through his hair, and he realised his mouth was wide open in a grimace of determination. It was all thanks to Kitty. Before he'd met her, he had spent his life either beside his father or confined within the walls created for him by his father's life. He had been raised to be the responsible son, the heir to his father's title, and the person who would represent and carry forth the family name and heritage in his offspring. But somehow, careening madly across the meadow with Kitty racing by his side, his entire life up to this moment seemed a waste. All those tedious events and social gatherings, the mindless chatter and the predictable topics of conversation, dulled in comparison to the feelings that pulsated through him as they raced. Kitty was the first to reach the hilltop, of course, and she waited for James to reach her with an enormous and obviously proud smile on her beautiful face. I do believe congratulations are in order, my lady, James said, as he reached her and took a moment to catch his breath. It did not appear that Kitty had even exerted herself. Was she even breathing hard at all? Perhaps I am more out of practice than I initially thought. Kitty giggled and shook her head, her dark locks tumbling down her shoulders. You did quite well, considering, Your Grace. Considering that I am the Duke of Somerset, an old curmudgeon, and only useful when I am sitting inside at quiet pursuits. Surely, I should be able to win a race with a beautiful maiden on my own estate. His tone was teasing, and she responded with another light laugh. Hardly an old curmudgeon, Your Grace. As to the rest. She shrugged nonchalantly and stared at the countryside around them. There is no shame in losing to a woman, Your Grace. I did not say there was, my lady, James pointed out. You should not feel intimidated by me in any way, Kitty said. All people are not the same. We have different strengths and weaknesses. We excel at different things. It is what makes us all unique. Not winning this particular race does not make you any less of a man, and you must never think such a thing, Your Grace. I shall remember that, my lady, James said, strangely grateful for her observation. He knew some people who would have implied that losing a horse race to a young lady was not an honourable way to uphold the family name. He lowered his gaze not wanting her to read any uncertainty in his manner. Tell me of your mother, Your Grace, Kitty requested after a brief silence, and James blinked at the unexpected change of topic. I wish to hear of your mother. You have not really mentioned her at all. I do not often speak of her, he admitted quietly. I have indeed noticed. Why is that? Kitty asked. My father was an important man, an inspiring man, and most people admired him greatly, James answered, not sure why she was asking about his mother. With undeniable certainty, I can say that your mother was likely the true pillar of strength for your father. James sighed and nodded. Indeed. 
my mother and father met and fell irrevocably in love. Their romance was something I saw with my own eyes was real, and yet I found it rather unrealistic to believe. How can a person gaze upon someone once, and without even knowing their name, fall in love? Even after all the years they were married, all the years my siblings and I watched them look upon one another in the same manner they always had, it still seemed like an illusion to me. People were under the impression they had the perfect marriage. But you knew the truth, Kitty asked. It is not what you think, my lady, James answered. They argued, of course, over important matters, especially when it came to my siblings and me. They were still happy, and they raised us with all the love they could possibly give. We grew up in what was essentially a happy home. It was their love for one another that did not fade, which surprised me and made me think it was all for show. He paused and gazed out at the rolling hills below them. On my mother's deathbed, I asked her whether it was all a lie, a ruse, to keep me believing there was such a thing as true love. She replied that each of us was born as half a soul, and when we find the other half of our soul, we will instantly know. We will feel complete with that person, even if the union does not make sense to anyone else. She followed her heart, and it led her to a life with a wonderful man who loved her and gave her three beautiful children. It was not an easy road for my mother, as she had to endure whispers from my father's family, who believed she was only marrying my father for his title. But she truly loved him. Kitty spoke softly, her voice filled with longing. James struggled to continue through the pain evoked by his memories. Indeed, she did. She told me that very day. Even though their marriage was not perfect, the manner in which they brought out the best in one another was the perfection she had always wished for. It was the way that my father looked at her that made it perfect. James's heart suddenly ached for his mother and father. He had lost them too soon and would give anything to have them alive and well. He had relied on their guidance too much, and now he was empty and lost. Except when he was in the presence of Kitty. The young lady beside him gave James the strength to speak of his mother for the very first time since her death. He had not even spoken to his siblings about the loss he felt, and yet here he was, pouring out his heart to a woman he had only met one day prior. The woman he was set to marry. Although it may have seemed odd to some, James felt comfortable in her presence, and he had received no judgment from her, even when she could clearly see that he was not one to easily process nor exhibit sentiment. Kitty's understanding nods and gestures provided hope that he was not a heartless or foolish man, such as he often felt in the company of others, but rather a man who simply required someone with the ability to see below the surface to the real James of Somerset. That does, indeed, sound as perfect a marriage as any woman could wish for. Kitty sighed dreamily, but a hint of sadness was present in her eyes. James stared intently at her. I apologize, my lady, he said, surprising himself as much as her. He had not intended to speak aloud, but the words formed on his lips before he could suppress them. For denying you the privilege of experiencing that kind of life. Kitty, who appeared wise beyond her years as she sat calmly on the back of the snow-white stallion, gazed out into the distance, straightened her shoulders, and then looked squarely at James. Things could have been much worse, Your Grace. What do you mean? You could have been old, unattractive, uninteresting, and difficult to speak with, Kitty answered, and then shrugged. But luckily, you are none of those things. You flatter me unnecessarily, my lady, James said, as he lowered his gaze. Although Kitty's words were complimentary, he still felt guilty for uprooting her against her will. He wished for her to be happy here at the estate, and with him, which meant that at some point he would have to reveal his growing feelings for her, 
even if there was a high risk of being rejected. He opened his mouth and then closed it again, deciding it could wait. Things were going well so far, and he did not wish to complicate the situation unnecessarily. He most certainly did not wish for things to become less comfortable between them. Your Grace, forgive me for being frank, but you are not at all what I expected, Kitty admitted, with a slight cringe. I most certainly had an idea in my head of what a man should be to grab my attention, and I didn't expect, well. She trailed off, and her cheeks turned delightfully pink. He found he could not take his eyes off them. I share your dilemma, my lady, he admitted, trying to put her at ease. I have been carrying an image around in my mind of the type of woman whom I would wish to have as my wife. Have you ever found such a woman? she asked. James lifted his chin and gazed out at the horizon. I thought I had once before, but she was not who I thought she was. Kitty raised her brow expectantly. That sounds rather intriguing. Do tell. Oh, no. It is a tragic and embarrassing tale, and most certainly not fit for your ears, especially not now, James said. You and I should not have any secrets between us, Kitty said, with a hint of coyness. My lady, I would rather wedge a sword in my gut than share the details of someone who does not carry any significance in my life. Also, I do not wish to spoil the lovely time we have spent together with such banalities. Kitty pursed her lips and nodded slowly. I understand, Your Grace. Now is not the time, but I will certainly manage to find out. Do not be so sure, my lady. James chuckled. Now, shall we head back? I find I have suddenly worked up quite an appetite for breakfast. As have I, Your Grace. A happy smile formed on James's lips as they turned their horses. Kitty was precisely the woman whom he would gladly spend the rest of his life alongside, whether she loved him in return or not. It was a delicate situation, as the more he spent time with Kitty, the more he wished to be with her, but he also did not wish for her to be unhappy with him. Perhaps it was much too soon to say, and of course, only time would tell, but James knew that no one else would be as good for him now that he had met Kitty. She was not only a tempting armful, but she was a truly outstanding female. Chapter 9 Despite Kitty's serene countenance, deep down, she wondered why the Duke did not wish to share with her the details of the woman who had seemingly broken his heart. Had the woman's actions left him unavailable for any other person? Was that why he seemed to struggle when it came to expressing himself any time matters of sentiment were involved? What had the young woman done to affect the Duke in such a manner? And did the Duke still secretly feel something for her? So many questions, and no answers were forthcoming. Kitty lowered her gaze to the horse in front of her and sighed. It is so lovely up here. Part of me doesn't want to return to the manor house so soon. We have been a while, and we would not wish for your parents to worry, James said. Oh no, we wouldn't wish that, of course. If I may say, my lady, it was lovely spending time with you without the presence of Lord and Lady Dunn, James said. With all due respect, of course. Kitty nodded knowingly. My parents can be especially tiresome as well as intimidating at times. Particularly my father, or so I have been told. It is not your father I am attempting to avoid, but your mother. Lady Dunn can be rather, again said with the utmost respect and no offence intended in the least, persistent, James admitted. Kitty couldn't help the slight laugh that escaped her. She appreciated the fact that James meant no disrespect with the words he spoke in regards to her mother, but she wholeheartedly agreed with him. The Countess was tedious, incessant, and rather annoying at times. I am aware you mean no disrespect or offence, Your Grace. 
At times I feel the same, especially when she insists that what she is doing is what is best for me. Her intentions are noble and good, but mostly I feel she does not know me at all, nor what is best for me. Perhaps all women act in such a way when they become mothers. She recognized James's attempt to reassure her and smiled. Perhaps, but I do hope, in all honesty, I will not be like that with my children, Kitty answered. She'd never even given marriage a second thought before the month prior. The thought of having children, of becoming a mother, it had seemed too far in the future to even consider. Suddenly, it was all closer than she'd realized. After all, one of her duties as the Duchess would be to produce an heir or three, would it not? I believe you will be a wonderful mother, my lady. One day, of course, James said. Your words are kind, Your Grace. Kitty smiled. The Duke cleared his throat. As we are to be married, I was wondering if you would consider calling me James when we are not in formal company. The request surprised and delighted her at the same time as he had already become James in her thoughts. I would very much like that, James. What a lovely name it was. She enjoyed saying it out loud. If you would call me Kitty, she added shyly. James's eyes lit up and a smile graced his handsome face. Come along, Kitty, he said. A delightful warmth filled her as they guided their horses back across the meadow. She followed James and his stallion and gazed around. The meadow must look lovely at sunset, James. I cannot personally say, Kitty, but I can imagine it would, James said. Suddenly he slowed and reached out his hand toward her. His touch was warm against her skin, and she imagined how heated his fingers might feel if they touched a different part of her body. Her cheeks immediately heated at the direction of her thoughts, and she lowered her gaze. Is everything well, James? Her voice was strained. Would it be a ludicrous request for us to walk the rest of the way? he asked. Certainly not, James. In fact, I think that is a marvellous suggestion, she answered. James dismounted and took Kitty's hands in his to assist her down from her horse. His skin was still warm against hers, and as her feet touched the ground, she glanced up at him. Their bodies were now very close to one another. His strong presence made her knees weak, and the scent of him was rather intoxicating. She was not certain what the scent was, but it appealed to her more than anything ever had before. His bright green eyes sent shivers of delight through her body. Her heart pounded in her chest, most certainly perfectly synchronized with James's heartbeat. She wished for nothing more than for James to take her in his arms and kiss her, but to her dismay, he released her and stepped away, handing off the horse's reins to the waiting groom. Take the horses back, Kenneth. We will walk the rest of the way. Yes, sir, the man said, and took off with their two horses trotting behind his. Then James returned to Kitty's side. My apologies, Kitty, James whispered, and shook his head as if in disapproval. To whom was his disapproving expression aimed? At her or himself? She was much too breathless to inquire. For what, James? Kitty frowned. She had been too forward. It is perhaps I who must apologize. I am perfectly aware you do not wish to experience feelings after what you have been through. I would most certainly not wish to. Before Kitty could complete her sentence, James leaned in and cradled her face with his hands. She drew in a shocked breath, and then his lips pressed against hers, drowning out any thoughts in her mind and any words she still wished to speak. His thumb stroked her cheek as the kiss lingered, the heat rising up into Kitty's bosom. Her eyes closed as a fire ignited inside her, and her heart pounded painfully, yet blissfully, against her ribs. James was the first to move away, 
which caused Kitty to open her eyes, her breathing ragged and strained. James's eyes were wide, and she wondered what thoughts ran through his mind. He seemed torn, as if wondering whether kissing her had been a wise choice, and Kitty desperately wished to assure him that it was. James, she panted breathlessly. He touched his lips, and despite the urge to kiss him once more, she bit her bottom lip and stepped away as well. My apologies, my lady. I do not know what came over me, he said. I do not behave this way. Please stop apologizing. And please do not feel guilty, as your action was not unwanted nor unsolicited. James's shoulders eased at her admission, but he remained several feet away from her. We must head back. Kitty turned and began to walk, and after a moment, she heard James begin to follow. Neither of them spoke a word, despite Kitty wishing to do so on multiple occasions. She did not know what to say. They had shared a kiss under the bright blue cloudless sky, causing her heart to pound like a thousand drums, and despite the thoughts wistfully dancing around in her mind, none of those thoughts would suffice to express the swirl of feelings inside her. Kitty guessed that James must be overwhelmed and fearful of expressing feelings for her or for anyone else. She got the impression he was a cautious man who didn't do much without considerable thought beforehand. Perhaps all this had happened too fast. And yet, why would he kiss her if he did not feel anything for her? If it was not something he did on a regular basis, surely the kiss meant something. Did he do this sort of thing on a regular basis? Kitty found she did not like that idea at all. James, she whispered eventually. My lady, James answered, returning to a more formal manner of address. Have you ever kissed another woman in such a manner? Kitty asked boldly. Not that I can recall, he answered simply, which made Kitty smile in relief. Perhaps he did not love her, and perhaps she was not the first woman he had kissed, but it sounded as if she was most certainly the only woman he had kissed in that manner. That smile on your face reeks of satisfaction. Tell me why, my lady, James said. Kitty lowered her gaze to the grass blowing lightly in the breeze. Simply, you stating that I am the first woman you kissed so tenderly makes me feel special. You are a special lady, Kitty. You should not forget that. I shall try, James, she said, and glanced shyly at him. His gaze still rested on her. But I am fairly certain I will require a reminder from time to time. A grin suddenly broke through his pensive expression, and he chuckled softly. Indeed. Happy to oblige. They reached the bottom of the meadow, where Kenneth was casually positioned in the shade of a leafy green tree, waiting with the horses. He quickly rose to his feet when James and Kitty approached. Your Grace, my lady, is everything well? Kenneth inquired. Indeed, Kenneth, thank you. The Duke was merely licking his wounds and required more time to do so, hence why we decided to walk, Kitty answered, before James could do so. I noticed you had won the race. Well done, my lady, Kenneth said. Thank you, dear Kenneth. Kitty smiled happily. Perhaps he can give his grace a few riding lessons, my lady. Kitty suppressed a chuckle and nodded. Perhaps I shall, Kenneth. Kenneth, lead us back to the manor, please, James ordered, his voice strained with a hint of annoyance. She frowned at James as the three of them remounted their horses, and together they rode back to the manor. The Duke seemed preoccupied with his own thoughts. Occasionally, he would return her gaze with an intent look, and Kitty began to wonder if she had accidentally hurt his feelings with her joke to the groom. Walking along the pathway between the manor and the stable, the horses came to a stop, and James dismounted. He stood beside Kitty's horse and assisted her in her own dismount, although, truth be told, she was perfectly capable of doing on her own. Of course, 
she did not make him aware of that fact, as she did not wish to add insult to injury. The last thing she wanted to do was to alienate James, after they had begun to connect on such a deeply personal level. The groom led the three horses to the stable, and Kitty turned to the Duke. That was a lovely morning, James. I thank you for that. It pleases me that my lady had a delightful time, he said. As he turned away, Kitty reached for his arm. James, wait. He glanced at her over his shoulder and turned to face her. Is everything well? she inquired, a strange feeling of nerves rising up inside her. James's eyes seemed dark and troubled as he gazed silently at her, his jaw clenched. There is something that requires my attention, he answered after a pause. Can I be of assistance to you, Your Grace? Kitty spoke softly. No. His answer was curt, and he turned away once more, disappearing through the doors of the manor. Kitty bit her bottom lip in a mixture of disappointment and concern. She couldn't understand the sudden change of temperament. Was it her? Surely, a little joke would not have caused him to look so severe and serious all of a sudden. She headed inside, too, attempting to persuade herself that she was not the one at fault. James clearly was preoccupied with something, and most likely it had little to do with her. He was a busy man, after all. By the time she had changed and arrived at the breakfast room, she had almost convinced herself that all was well. Chapter 10 Much later that night, as the manor darkened and quieted down for the night, James paced around his bedchamber, the rain drumming hard against the windows. He could not forget the kiss he and Kitty had shared earlier that morning, but feelings of unease had arisen alongside the attraction. James had vowed to himself, ever since Lady Montgomery exited his life, that he would not allow any other woman to reach that vulnerable part of him. And yet, in a contrary part of his mind, he wished Kitty would appear at his door and inform him that he needed to kiss her again. The taste of her sweet mouth still lingered on his lips as he stared out the window. In fact, he couldn't stop thinking about the taste of her and her delicious scent. He wished desperately to possess the courage to go to her and explain why he was acting so foolishly in trying to keep her at a distance. It had been a long while since anyone had expressed such an interest in him and made him feel the way he felt during their kiss. He had not spoken much during dinner and excused himself earlier when he received a letter from an old acquaintance. The letter gave him the chance to retreat to his study. Perhaps that retreat marked him as a coward who did not deserve to have such a fine young woman as Kitty to be his wife. The rain continued to pour down, and it was rather odd to remember that, only hours ago, there was not a cloud in sight. The storm had arrived faster than anyone could have predicted, but James's paranoia suggested this might be an omen. An omen for what, though? Its meaning was still unknown. He continued to stare outside, musing on his relationship with Kitty, until movement caught his attention. It was only for a moment, but James's brow furrowed as he stepped closer to the window. A dark figure opened the door of the stable and rushed inside. James's jaw clenched, but he was fairly certain it was simply one of his grooms. No person in his sane mind would enter the stables in this downpour unless it was part of their duties. Thunder rumbled in the distance, and James stepped away from the window, closing the drapes. He recalled a memory from his youth where his mother had warned him and his siblings of the dangers of thunderstorms, and that they should never leave the drapes open. Her words echoed in his mind as clearly as if she spoke them for the very first time. James sighed as the nostalgia struck him in the same manner as thunder and lightning struck the earth. He sat on the leather chair in the corner of his chamber and reached for the book that lay on the table beside him. 
Perhaps the tome would distract him from thoughts of the delectable Kitty and what she might be doing right now. He settled into a comfortable position and immersed himself between the pages of an old philosophy book his father had adored, as the fire in the hearth provided much-needed heat to warm not only the entire room, but also the cold chill he felt inside. He was unsure how much time had passed when a soft, barely audible knock sounded on his chamber door. He wondered if he had imagined the sound. Another knock sounded, more urgent than the previous one. He closed the book, placing it on the table beside him, and made his way to the door. When he glanced at the large, upright clock that stood in the corner of his chambers, his brow furrowed. It was nearly midnight, and his servants were well aware he did not wish to be disturbed tonight. He reached for the door and opened it slowly, sucking in a deep breath at the sight of a drenched kitty standing in front of him. Her hair was dripping wet, her dress clung to her body, and her lips trembled violently, whether with the cold or fear, was not clear. My lady! He quickly stepped aside, allowing her to enter. Propriety did not enter his head at this moment. Are you well? What has happened? Kitty entered without a word, and James closed the door. As he reached for a woolen blanket to wrap around her shoulders, she turned to him with an intent expression. Was it you I saw out at the stables earlier? he asked. What the devil were you thinking, venturing out on a night like this? She shivered violently before answering. I love walking in the rain, but the downpour got so heavy. She trailed off, and he shook his head, unsure of everything when it came to his betrothed. She was so conventional, and yet so not in many ways. What did I do wrong, James? Kitty inquired suddenly, her voice hoarse and breathless. He frowned. I do not understand, my lady. We had a lovely morning, and we shared parts of ourselves with each other. Kitty slowly approached him, dripping water on the rug. We shared a tender and wonderful moment where you kissed me. You even openly admitted that you had never kissed any woman in such a manner, yet you did not speak much during dinner, excused yourself early, and now you are refusing to use my name and staring at me as if I'm a stranger. Her eyes were so big and round and full of hurt. What had he done? My lady... It's Kitty when we are alone, she said, a fierce flash in her eyes catching him off guard. Remember? James, what did I do to make you not wish to be near me? Was it my forwardness in allowing the kiss? Absolutely not, my lay, er, uh, Kitty. It is nothing that you did, James admitted. I am the one at fault. Tell me how I can fix it. If only that were possible. It is not within your power to fix it. Kitty stepped so close he could feel the cold emanating from her body. Her lips trembled as she glanced up at him and her hands touched his chest. The contact sent pulses of longing through him. Despite knowing it would most certainly not be in either one's best interest, he could not fight the feelings of desire her presence ignited in his body. He placed his hands on her narrow shoulders and bent his head, pressing his lips against hers. A soft moan escaped her, and she moved right into his embrace. He wrapped his arms around her, pulling her tight against him. He could feel her heart pounding against his chest, and her bosom was crushed against him. He released her lips long enough to admit, This is why I tried to distance myself. When you are near, I don't think I can trust myself not to touch you or hold you or... I want that, James, she whispered, and he released a groan. I'm trying to do the right thing by you, Kitty. I don't want you to do the right thing. He kissed her again, more thoroughly this time and felt the stirring deep in his loins. 
It was torture to pull back, but he had to, for her sake. He had to make sure. Kitty, I want this, of course, but I do not wish for you to do anything you will regret in the morning. Kitty tilted her chin upwards, staring into his eyes, her own sparkling like two sapphires in the moonlight. James, there will not be a single thing I will regret, as long as it is you who does it to me, Kitty murmured, her gaze beckoning him to take her. You are to be my husband, remember? Only if you are certain, he whispered. She nodded slowly, her lips pouting at him and drawing him in even without more words. Chapter 11 James's fingertips skimmed Kitty's back, and delight washed over her. She glanced at James, who lay beside her, and smiled with utter satisfaction. She had never thought that lovemaking would be this wonderful. She had the feeling it was only because it was James, and she snuggled close, wanting to immerse herself in his embrace. His skin was smooth to the touch, a delightful fact she had discovered when she'd removed his dress shirt earlier. His pale, broad shoulders, the same shoulders that had held her so tightly against him, were now beside her, at ease and exposed. Kitty rolled onto her back, allowing James's fingertips to graze across her stomach. Little goosebumps arose in the wake of his touch, and she shivered, but this time, her shivers were not born of cold. She couldn't believe the effect of his presence on her body. Was she so wanton that once was not enough? Why did she feel as if she needed him inside her once again? James, she whispered. Kitty, James said in return, a slight smile lifting his lips. The rain has stopped. There was a moment of quiet as James turned his head to listen. Indeed it has. When I was a young girl, I spent most rainy nights indoors, as a true lady should, Kitty said, and then rolled her eyes. But there is no better feeling than walking in the rain. It awakens my senses and allows me to feel invigorated. Was that truly why you were outside earlier tonight? James inquired. It seemed like a good idea at the time, Kitty answered. But it was so heavy, I dashed into the stables for shelter. So I saw, James chuckled. Though, if I had known it was you, I would have sent someone to ensure you were not drenched by the rain. But I would have been no less drenched regardless. Kitty grinned and pouted. James shrugged. What were you doing in the stables? Why not just come back into the manor house? In all honesty, Kitty said slowly, glancing at James for his reaction, I wish to relive the happy moments I spent with you in the meadow by visiting the horses we rode. And it likely sounds utterly daft, but it made me feel better for a while. Only for a while. She nodded her head. Indeed, which was the reason I dared to come here, to your bedchamber. I wanted clarification with regards to your seeming withdrawal from me. As I mentioned, I was convinced I had done something to upset you, and it was very upsetting, not knowing what it was, she explained. Kitty, James murmured once more, and shifted his body closer to hers. He reached for her hand and weaved his fingers between hers, then closed them, creating a firm grasp. There is nothing more important to me than your happiness. Despite not being acquainted with you for a long period of time, or even a week, Kitty chuckled with amusement. Indeed, James smiled. Despite knowing you for only a handful of days, it does feel as though we have known one another far longer. I could not agree more, James. Why is that? Kitty placed their interlocked hands against her chest. Hopefully, the act would allow him to feel how hard her heart was pounding. He must know by now that she was far from indifferent to his presence. I am not entirely certain. I attempted to rationalize it in my mind, but I could not. 
I still cannot, in fact. Opening up to people is difficult for me, and feelings are difficult for me to understand. Even my own, sadly. Your father taught you to hide your feelings, Kitty whispered, and turned to look at him. She could tell her guess was right by the sadness in his eyes. She understood such sadness. She had been raised in a similar manner. Both of them had been taught to appease their parents, at any cost. Kitty slowly pushed herself into a sitting position. James, I must return to my own bedchamber. I wouldn't wish for my mother or father to see me here. There is no telling what my father might do. I understand, James answered, and sat upright as well. He reached out his hand to her and smiled tenderly. Perhaps we can speak during breakfast, with Lord and Lady Dunn present, of course. Kitty's eyes widened and a wave of panic moved through her gut. To discuss what precisely, James? He chuckled and shook his head. Not this, my lady. I simply wish to discuss the plans for our wedding. I confess. I am rather excited by the prospect now. A swarm of butterflies appeared in place of her panic, and the tension in her shoulders eased. As am I, James. That would be lovely. She slid off the bed and gathered her scattered clothing. She dressed while James watched, thanking heaven for the front fasteners on her dress. When she was done, she held her shoes in her hands, which were still drenched from the rain, and approached the bed. She leaned closer to him and grinned. It has truly been a pleasure, Your Grace. Indeed it has, my lady, James murmured in return, and pulled her in for a final kiss on the lips. I look forward to breakfast. As do I, Kitty whispered, and without another word she left his bedchamber, hoping her parents would not catch her in the dark hallways nor hear her as she returned to her own chambers. Kitty glanced surreptitiously at James across the breakfast table and noticed the smile on his lips. Was he remembering their encounter in his chambers last night? Did he still feel her touch on his skin as she most certainly felt his? Their eyes met in a brief yet powerful moment before her mother interrupted. I am delighted to hear you wish to shorten the engagement, Your Grace, but what prompted this decision? There is no need to wait, Lady Dunn. When your daughter and I went riding in the meadow, we had a very interesting conversation. We have come to know one another quite well, in fact, and it only seems fitting that we marry as soon as possible, James answered. The Duke is correct. Why wait? Lord Dunn agreed smiling his approval. Indeed, James answered, and glanced at Kitty. Your daughter is a wonderful young lady, and she will make an excellent wife. She has poise and grace, and is a daughter who should fill you with delight. Your words are kind, Lady Dunn beamed. We are utterly proud of her and the woman she has become. As you should be. James's smile was directed straight at Kitty. Her heart pounded in her chest as he speared her with that smouldering look. It promised much in the near future. She couldn't wait. If I may, Your Grace, her father interjected. Could I perhaps suggest a wedding nearer to Christmas? Our family normally travels to Somerset and that timing would be ideal. Without wavering, the Duke answered. It is entirely Kitty's decision. Kitty's jaw dropped as she glanced at James in disbelief. From the very beginning of this arrangement, she had felt as if she had no choice, no opinion, and no control over anything, and yet James had now passed the decision of when they would marry to her. Of course, she wished to marry him sooner than anticipated, but she was unsure of how soon would be appropriate. Tomorrow? Perhaps an autumn wedding would please my lady, James suggested when she hesitated. Kitty pursed her lips, considering. Autumn was her most adored season. How had he guessed? 
Possibly she'd mentioned it in passing, and James had remembered that small and seemingly insignificant detail. Whatever the reason, it sounded perfect. She sighed happily and nodded. Autumn is my favourite time of the year, Your Grace. James nodded knowingly, which meant the world to Kitty, and she reciprocated the gesture. With all due respect, Your Grace, I understand your wish to marry my daughter at the soonest, but is that not perhaps too soon? Lady Dunn said, a scowl of disapproval on her aged face. My daughter is still a child. I am most certainly not a child, mother, Kitty corrected. My lady, James said to the countess, and shifted in his seat to have a better view of Lady Dunn. I understand you and Lord Dunn have raised Kitty from the moment she came into this world, and what a fine woman she has turned out to be. For that, I thank you. As Kitty has mentioned, she is not a child any longer, and despite still being your daughter, she is free to choose, as she will be even after we are married. Lady Dunn opened her mouth to speak, but then shut it again. James's opinion of her meant a great deal to Kitty, and she knew already that she would never tire of this wonderful man, to whom she had given herself so freely. The moment reminded her of the tale he had told her about how his mother and father had fallen in love so quickly. She hoped she would be lucky enough to have a long and happy life with James. There was silence around the table until her father finally spoke. So be it. Our daughter shall have an autumn wedding. There is certainly much to prepare, Lady Dunn said. Indeed, James agreed. Your Grace, could I have a word with my daughter? Whatever you wish to say, Mother, you can say to both myself and the Duke, Kitty interjected, her voice confident as she gazed at her mother. He is, after all, soon to be my husband. She was not certain if it was due to James giving her the control to decide things for herself, or simply having had enough of her mother's incessant demands. Perhaps it was both, but Kitty had not felt this powerful before now. Lady Dunn pursed her lips, and then nodded. Are you certain that you do not want to wait a while longer before you are married, my dear? We have mere months to prepare, and I would not wish for you to rush into this. You and father both agreed that there was no need to wait longer. The Duke and I have become well acquainted, despite the short amount of time we have spent together. I cannot begin to describe it, but he and I share something wonderful, something rare. I would not call it love quite yet, but there is certainly something there, Kitty explained. He and I will be wed in the autumn, on a beautiful day between the shedding trees, upon a carpet of leaves in hues of orange, yellow and red. We will be wed and start our life together as the Duke and Duchess of Somerset. And we will be happy together, I am sure. Lady Dunn swallowed as if there was something stuck in her throat, but nodded. As you wish, my dear. The decision lays with you. Your father and I simply want the best for you. Why was her mother changing her mind now? She had all but forced Kitty into this marriage from the very beginning. I am aware of that, mother, and that is why you have arranged for me to marry the Duke. There is no better man, Kitty said. Lady Dunn glanced at her daughter, a hint of apprehension flickering in her eyes. Your words are kind, my lady, James said, and she smiled confidently at him. Urgent footsteps sounded in the hallway outside, and the butler appeared in the doorway, closely followed by Kenneth. The latter's face was flushed, and his eyes panic-stricken. "'Your Grace,' Kenneth said. "'My sincerest apologies for this abrupt intrusion, but there is something you must see.' "'What is it, Kenneth? Is everything all right?' "'What has happened?' James inquired. "'There is no time, Your Grace.' Please, you must come with me to the stable, Kenneth urged. Pardon me, my lord, my ladies, James said apologetically, and stood from the table. Shall I accompany you? Kitty asked. 
James nodded silently, offering his arm to her. She took it, and he assisted her from the table. They followed Kenneth outside and along the path to the stable, wondering what was so urgent that the groom had interrupted the Duke's breakfast with his guests. She hoped it was nothing serious, but whatever it was, she was equally hopeful her presence would provide joy for James. Chapter 12 James hastily made his way toward the stable behind a hurrying Kenneth, with Kitty by his side. What on earth could have happened? Kitty inquired. I am not certain, but Kenneth would not be in such a state if it were not important, or serious, James answered. Kenneth opened the stable doors and waited for James and Kitty to reach him. Is it safe for my lady to enter? James inquired. Indeed, Your Grace, there is no danger to any one of us, Kenneth answered. Then what is the matter? Kitty asked breathlessly. It is Lord Windsor, Kenneth answered. Who is Lord Windsor? Is he family? Kitty asked, as they stepped into the stable. Lord Windsor, the Palomino stallion whom Kitty had noticed was ill yesterday, had been in his father's possession since James was a young boy. He had promised to arrange for an animal doctor to examine the horse after Kitty's request, and the matter had entirely slipped his mind until now. This, Kenneth stated, as he came to a standstill in front of one of the stalls, is Lord Windsor. Kitty stepped closer, and her eyes widened. A gasp escaped her throat as she entered the stall. Lord Windsor was curled up in the straw, barely moving as Kitty knelt beside him. James approached Kenneth and placed his hands on his hips. How bad is he? He is not getting any better, Your Grace. He refuses to eat or drink. I am even surprised he is allowing my lady to enter his stall. His behaviour was troubling last evening, his eyes appeared. James raised his brows expectantly and waited for Kenneth to continue speaking. Demonic, Kenneth said, in a hushed tone. Is there anything more we can do? James asked. Your Grace, this horse needs to be seen by an animal doctor, as I mentioned before, Kitty said, annoyance in her tone. My lady. James sighed and turned to her. Lord Windsor is an old stallion and... And what? Does he not deserve to live? Kitty asked incredulously. That is most certainly not what I am insinuating, my lady, James proclaimed. You must understand, though, that there is not much an animal doctor can do. He will most likely have the animal put out of its misery. How can you be so heartless? Kitty rose from the ground, her eyes snapping with fury. James stared at his fiancée, surprised by her aggressive attitude. I am not heartless, my lady. I am merely realistic. The horse doctor cannot perform miracles. Lord Windsor is an elderly horse. There is nothing more we can do for him. You do not know this for a fact, she exclaimed. It is just a horse, Kitty, he stated, but as soon as the words left his lips, regret followed swiftly. He was well aware of how much she adored horses, and his words were cruel, even from one who did not love horses as much as she did. Tears formed in her eyes, and she pursed her lips. My lady, James began, and stepped toward her, ready to apologise. Kitty shook her head and pushed past him. Leave me alone. He grabbed her hand and whirled her around. Please, my lady, unhand me at once, she hissed. In an attempt not to make a scene, James released her, allowing her to storm out of the stable. He glanced at Kenneth with a sigh. Have the animal doctor come examine Lord Windsor, please, Kenneth. At once. Right away, Your Grace, Kenneth answered, then added, Your Grace is wrong in thinking he is merely a horse. I am aware, but thank you for reminding me, James said, 
and speedily left the stables. Once outside, he saw Kitty on her way to the gardens and called out to her. As expected, she did not acknowledge him and continued walking. James was well aware that she was angry and hurt. He wished to make things right, although he was unsure how he would be able to do that. My lady, please wait, he called out, lessening the distance between them. Kitty came to a stop in front of the old wrought iron gate that led to the back garden where no one was permitted to enter and where James had not ventured since his father had passed. That area had been the late Duke's private garden and James did not possess the courage or emotional strength to visit there. He doubted he ever would. Kitty rested her hands on the horizontal bar of the gate and stood silently, staring out into the distance. James carefully approached, but did not wish to come too close at the risk of a possible outburst. Perhaps she would simply ignore him further, which would also be justified. My lady. James spoke in a calm voice, but only to keep himself composed. Kitty remained motionless in front of the gate, and he continued. I am sincerely sorry for what I said. I am aware that you have a deep adoration for horses, and it was cruel and unkind of me to insinuate that Lord Windsor is merely just a horse. He is much more than that. I know that, of course. Perhaps he is just a horse to you, but he is a living, breathing creature who deserves respect. He too feels pain and fear and love. Did your father not teach you these things, Your Grace? All living things should be treated with kindness, grace and mercy. Her words twisted a knife deep in his heart. His father had not, in fact, taught him any such thing. I am deeply sorry, my lady. Kitty turned slowly, her eyes full of unshed tears and her hands clasped together. It is now obvious that I do not know you at all. Despite the morning we spent at the meadow, the connection I felt toward you, and last night. James's brow furrowed as he stepped close to her. What are you attempting to say, my lady? Kitty looked straight at him, her gaze connecting with incredible accuracy. Simply that I cannot marry a man who does not love horses, not even a little bit. You're basing this opinion solely on the fact that I did not engage an animal doctor to examine Lord Windsor? James asked incredulously. It is about more than just the horse, Your Grace, Kitty said, a tear running down her cheek. James wished he could wipe the tear away, but he dared not move. Kitty was hurt and upset, and he did not wish to make matters worse than they already were. I understand that you have been emotionally unavailable for some time now, who knows, perhaps for most of your life, and this arrangement between you and my father was not meant to involve any sort of feelings of love or affection. I accepted that. I accepted that I would be in a loveless marriage with a man who did not feel any affection toward me, despite being his wife. I convinced myself that was what I was willing to accept. What I will not accept is a man who shows little sympathy for a sick horse, despite your promise to have him cared for by a doctor, Kitty explained. My lady, James tried to interrupt, but she was clearly not willing to listen. You lied to me, and I would rather disappoint my whole family than be married to a liar, Kitty exclaimed. Sudden anger rolled through James's gut as he stared at the woman before him. A person to whom he had opened up and committed to being married to for the rest of his life. How could she say such a thing? He garbled the first thing that came into his head. And I would rather die alone here on my estate than be married to a controlling woman who constantly needs to be reminded to behave with decorum. Kitty's mouth dropped open and her breathing became ragged. My initial impression of you was correct. You are simply a miserable man that no one else would ever want. Perhaps now I understand why you're still alone, Your Grace. 
I pity you. The insult was unwarranted and untrue. And no other man will want a defiled woman, he shot back. As soon as he uttered the words, he wished them back, but it was too late. She had infuriated him by the mere fact that she wished to end their arrangement due to a horse, but that did not excuse what he had just said. Kitty's eyes widened, and she took a step back, as if she couldn't bear to be near him a moment longer. I shall inform my father of our decision, and we will leave as soon as possible. I do not wish to remain here, where I am clearly no longer welcome. James's heart hurt, but pride caused him to lift his chin and look down his nose. Indeed, the sooner the better. Of all the mistakes I have made in my life, you are by far the biggest. Before James could utter a response, Kitty turned on her heel and stormed off in the direction of the house. James growled angrily, his jaw clenched. He could not believe what had just transpired, and all because of a horse. Perhaps it was in both their best interests to part ways, as things had obviously become more complicated than he had ever imagined they might. When Lord Dunn had proposed the arrangement, James had assumed the arrangement would remain purely businesslike. He had never expected to have feelings for his betrothed. But as the feelings had risen up inside him, he knew it was only a matter of time before he fell in love. And therein lay heartbreak. Eventually, he had known she would reject him, or worse, only tolerate him for the sake of appearances. James had heard tales of married noblemen who despised their wives, and whose wives, in turn, despised them. Of course, they were civil and even affectionate at times while they were in the public eye, but behind closed doors he couldn't imagine a colder and more lonely existence. Clearly, he had been correct. She had rejected him already, and all because of a horse. As he walked back to the manor house, he hoped that he would be able to ignore the pain in his heart that had surfaced the moment the first angry word was spoken. Chapter 13 I beg your pardon. Her mother's eyes were wide as she closed the door of Kitty's bedchambers and stared at her in disbelief. I am not marrying that man, and it is best if we leave now. I do not wish to be here a moment longer. Kitty explained, and turned to Lady Dunn. Plus, he agrees. He wants us gone, as soon as possible. Kitty! Her mother clutched her bosom. Where does this mutiny come from? Not an hour ago, you and the Duke spoke of moving up the wedding date, and now you are informing me that the arrangement is cancelled, and a mutually agreed cancellation at that. I have had a change of heart, Kitty answered, as she approached her travelling chest and opened it. Clearly, so has he. As she opened the wardrobe, removing her gowns and dresses from inside, her mother inquired, This does not have anything to do with the letter from Edward, does it? Kitty froze. The letter from Edward Walsh had slipped her mind entirely. If it does, I do urge you to reconsider, my dear. It is not because of Edward's letter, mother, despite the fact that you hid it from me, Kitty answered. Don't be so dramatic, Kitty. I did that for your benefit, the Countess said, throwing her hands in the air. And that turned out swimmingly, wouldn't you agree? Kitty asked. She turned and froze as her father stepped into her bedchambers. His jaw was clenched as he stared at her making her feel small and powerless. I have seen many theatrical performances in my life, my dear, but nothing to quite such an extent, her father scolded. Announcing to everyone who would listen that you wished to leave and never return to Woodlock Manor was beyond the pale. Kitty nodded her head. I meant every word, father. Is this about the letter from the Walsh boy? her father inquired as he turned to his wife. It is not regarding the letter, father. 
Kitty sighed and threw another dress into her chest. Enough with the theatrics, Kitty. Why did you terminate the agreement? Her mother asked, her expression serious. James was not the man I thought he was. He turned out to be precisely the kind of man I would avoid at all costs. Did the Duke hurt you in any manner? Her father demanded. She could not and would not ever lie about such a thing. Physically, no, father. My dear Kitty, I have spent many hours organizing this arrangement. It would ensure our family's survival as well as... Kitty's patience had reached its limit. I will not marry that man, father. Her parents glanced worriedly at one another, and finally her father stepped forward. My dearest Kitty, we have no money, and the Duke will provide us with the financial stability we so desperately require. Require? No, they wanted luxury. I do not care, Kitty whispered. Lady Dunn paled and asked with a sharp tone, Do you wish to leave us poor and destitute? What would people think? What would they say? I do not care, she exclaimed angrily. Put me out to work as a seamstress if you must. I will not marry him. Her mother's expression blanched. However, her father appeared unaffected by her anger and approached. Kitty, please think clearly and soberly with regards to this decision. It does not only affect you, but your mother and me as well. I apologize, father. Kitty sighed and took her father's hands. I understand that you relied on this arrangement, but I cannot go through with this. If you would tell me precisely why. One of the Duke's horses was ill, and I pointed it out to him, advising him to call an animal doctor to examine the horse. He promised me that he would do so, but he didn't. Now the horse is very ill, possibly dying, and he was very nonchalant about it, claiming it was just a horse that would likely be put out of its misery, Kitty explained. Father, I am aware it might sound foolish and exaggerated to feel as strongly as I do about a horse, but I cannot marry a man who does not care about animals in the same manner as I. He also lied to me, and I cannot marry a liar. Many women have married worse men, her mother said from behind them. Quiet, Penelope, her father commanded, and glanced back at Kitty. His eyes had softened, and he squeezed her hands lightly. Are you certain, my dear? Her mother gasped and interjected. You cannot consider. I am sure, father, Kitty answered truthfully. Her father's love of horses won through. She saw his understanding in his gaze as he nodded thoughtfully. What will happen to us, George? Her mother asked plaintively. I am not quite certain, her father answered and turned to his wife. But I assure you that I will do everything in my power to ensure you are well taken care of, even if it means selling my estate as well as my business. Her father released Kitty's hands and walked toward her mother, who had begun to cry. As he placed his arms around his wife in a light embrace, Kitty was riddled with guilt. It was all her fault that their financial woes had not come to a satisfactory end. Soon they would probably be evicted from their home and have to resort to living in the slums or even on the streets. Kitty bit her lower lip as she was well aware that her mother would not survive something as tragic as that and that it would all be Kitty's fault. Nonetheless, Kitty could not go through with the marriage and even if she wished to, for the sake of her parents, James had made it very clear that he would most certainly not agree to it. Not now. Not again. Especially not after the words she'd said to him and the ones he'd thrown straight back at her in his anger. Her chance to save her parents was gone and there was little she could do to rectify it. Within the hour, several of James's footmen carried their suitcases and trunks outside to where their coach was waiting. 
The footman loaded the luggage onto the coach, and while her parents climbed inside, her mother still silently weeping, Kitty glanced at Woodlock Manor one final time. The breeze blew against her face as she gazed out at the gardens, the flowers blooming in vibrant colours across the lawn. She would miss the decadent sunlight, and her lungs would miss the fresh country air. Her heart would miss the feeling of exhilaration she had experienced riding across those meadows, a place she had unexpectedly found happiness and contentment. Her gaze travelled up to the manor house, and in a large window on the second floor, she noticed James standing motionless, staring directly at her, his arms crossed across his broad chest. Although a million thoughts rushed through her mind, what she still wished to say, what she could have said, and what she wished she had not said, none of it mattered now. Kitty stared at her former betrothed for a few moments, tempted to raise her hand in a strange farewell. Eventually, she managed to rein in the impulse, and instead simply turned away and climbed into the coach with her parents. The air inside was stuffy and tight, even before the coach started to move. Kitty lowered her gaze, staring at her hands clenched on her lap. My dear, are you all right? her father inquired. Kitty glanced up at him. I am, father. I simply cannot wait until all this is over and we are home once again. For however brief it remains our home, a small voice whispered in her mind. She blinked back tears as the coach began to move, and a strange feeling rose up inside Kitty. It felt like regret, but that could not be allowed to bear fruit. Instead, her stubborn nature pushed her feelings all the way back down from whence they came, and by the time they had left the Duke's estate, she barely felt anything at all. Chapter 14 A week later, there was silence around the dinner table, as James, William and Lizzie ate quietly. James did not fail to notice the glances of concern that his siblings exchanged when they thought he wasn't looking, but he hoped they would not inquire as to why Kitty and her family had left on such short notice. James had not told them any details, but he was certain they wanted to know what had happened. The image of Kitty staring up at him as he had stood watching her before she climbed into her family's coach was etched in his mind. He recalled her icy glare shredding his soul to pieces. Regardless, things were better this way. They had said unforgivable things to one another, things that could never be recalled. He could not love her in the manner in which she desired and deserved, and despite James's wish to keep her at the estate, apologise, and mend things between them, it was far too late to even try. Out of sheer curiosity, James, are you not going to discuss this with us? Lizzie spoke finally, breaking the silence. The awkward tension still remained. Discuss what? James asked, not glancing up. Do not be so obtuse. The fact that Kitty and her family left on such short notice is not something you, or anyone else here, can ignore, brother, Lizzie answered. Was there an emergency that required Lord Dunn's attention? No. James's answer was simple and concise, and he hoped that would be the end of the conversation, but he was well aware of his sister's insistent and tenacious nature. Then what was the reason for their sudden departure, if it was not an emergency? I do not wish to discuss it, James answered. It has been several days since their departure, and you have said nothing. Not a single word, nor provided an explanation, Lizzie continued, pushing him. We have had enough, James. Tell us what happened. He sighed. It is none of your concern. But it is, brother. You have been a nightmare to live with. You are rude, curt and boorish, and I refuse to accept that nothing is the matter. Lizzie's insults were well aimed, and yet that fact only made anger roil more fiercely in his belly. 
Perhaps I shall leave as well, as I am such a thorn in everyone's side, James said, as he theatrically stood from the table and stormed out of the dining hall. His blood boiled in his veins as he marched through the hallway, and soon he found himself in the great hall. The moon shone brightly in the sky and cast a silver glow on the floor of the huge space. The image of Kitty, bathed in moonlight as she lay beside him in bed, swam into his mind. In that moment, her eyes were focused on him with an intensity he had never before experienced, and he could practically taste her on his lips once again. James lowered his gaze and stared at the floor, feeling uncertain about the future and how he would face it without Kitty. A sigh escaped as he heard soft footsteps behind him. He straightened his shoulders. Please leave me be, Elizabeth, James implored, remaining completely still. I am most certainly not in the mood to converse. I can see that, Lizzie answered, but kept her distance. I hate seeing you this way, James. He crossed his arms, hoping she would take the hint and leave. Is there anything I can do? Lizzie asked instead. There is not a single thing you, nor I, can do to rectify this, James answered. And what is this you are referring to? He turned slowly to face his sibling and sighed wearily. I have made a mess of things with Kitty. What happened? Lizzie asked as she stepped toward him. Please tell me. I cannot bear seeing you suffer this way, James. Kitty and I will not be married. She decided it would be in both our best interests that we should part ways, James finally answered. Did Kitty say that, or you? James's cheeks heated. It may have been mutual. Did she say why? He shifted in discomfort. I would not tend to an ill horse after I made her a promise that I would call an animal doctor to examine the stallion. I spoke foolishly and without regard for her feelings in front of her, and she became upset before I could rectify the situation. She accused me of being a liar and being insensitive. Simply a man she could not marry. There were other words said. It was not pleasant. On either side. I am truly sorry, James. I was not aware. You did not say a thing. I am the one at fault. There is no need for you to apologize. James sighed again. Perhaps it is indeed better this way. For whom? Lizzie asked. Her father was rather persistent in pursuing this union. Their desperation was imminent. What do you mean, sister? Lizzie opened her mouth, but expelled no words, an instant expression of guilt and embarrassment appearing on her face. Perhaps it is not my place to say anything, James. I wish to know what you meant. Now, James insisted. I assure you, it is nothing. It does not matter any more. The arrangement is terminated, and you are back on the market. Lizzie forced a smile. Hardly. I wish to have nothing to do with women ever again. Are you certain that is what you want, James? Lizzie asked. Why would I not? James asked. Is my word not of any worth to you? That is not what I am saying, James. I know you. I have known you my entire life, and I know when you push people away, it is usually for good. It has happened quite a few times in the past, the most recent being Lady Penelope. Do not, James warned. Lizzie raised her hands in defeat and spoke quietly. You and I both know how those types of situations affect you, and it pains me to think that once again you are going through this, alone. But you are not alone, brother, Lizzie said and placed her hand reassuringly against James's shoulder. You do have us. William and I do love you, you know. Thank you, sister. You were very fond of her, 
Lizzie pointed out. Not at first glance, of course, but the manner in which you gazed at her was endearing. Kitty is a beautiful woman, James answered, and cleared his throat in order to prevent himself from uttering something foolish and revealing. But like any beautiful woman, she had a flaw. She thought more of horses than she did of me. You did not honour your promise, Lizzie admonished, and James stared at her in shock. It is true, so do not dare stare at me as if I am the liar, brother. James swallowed hard. I lied to her. Is that what you wish to hear? Why did you lie to her? Why did you make a promise to her you could not keep, or never intended to keep in the first place? Lizzie asked. He didn't have a good answer for that. He cleared his throat before continuing. I did not think it was so important. I was aware that she adored horses, but it did not occur to me how much. I should have listened to her, taken note of what was important to her. Perhaps then she would not have left. James sighed. Lizzie cocked her head. You are in a bind, brother. No, I am not. It is over, and now I will carry on with my life. Kitty can now find herself another husband, a man worthy of her hand, James said. Lizzie shrugged her shoulders and sighed. I wonder if you do this on purpose. Do what? James asked. Lizzie glanced at her brother and cocked her head. Do foolish and inconsiderate things to ensure people do not come close to you or prevent you from coming close to them. James gasped, narrowing his gaze at his sister. That is absurd and presumptuous. It is not, Lizzie said, staring hard at him. You purposely push people away by doing and saying foolish things in the hope they wish nothing to do with you. You would rather be alone, wallowing in self-pity, than feel vulnerable with someone who sees the broken soul you are on the inside. That is enough, he snapped. He didn't want to hear any of this. No, James. It is time you heard this, whether you wish to or not, Lizzie said, pointing her finger at him. You were bearable when William and I were younger, but after father passed, you disappeared. You are now a mere shell of the man you were before. Things began to improve, and then mother passed, and you were worse than ever. That was enough. Elizabeth. I am not done, Lizzie said, as she dismissed him with a simple hand gesture. I understand father raised you to be his successor and his heir to all this, she said, motioning to the manor around them. And there are many things that rest on your shoulders. Responsibilities William and I cannot begin to fathom. It has not been easy for any of us with you shutting off your feelings. Pushing away the people who care for you and love you is not the answer. Including Kitty. Or rather, especially Kitty. James stood straighter, stiffening his spine. You are mistaken, Elizabeth. Kitty does not love me. She made that fact perfectly clear during our argument. Lizzie cocked her head. It certainly seems that way. You are mistaken, James repeated, with a sterner and clearer tone. Lizzie shrugged. Perhaps I am. It was indeed Kitty who snuck out of your bedchamber in the early hours of the morning, was it not? James glared at his baby sister. You have no right to spy on me. Oh, please, spare me the lecture. Lizzie rolled her eyes, then examined her reflection in the glass pane of the large window. And I was not spying on you. I merely happened to be roaming the halls at the same time. And I am supposed to believe that, James scoffed. Believe what you wish. It is the truth, Lizzie said. Tell me this, James, and forgive me for wishing to know these intimate details, but what did you feel while she lay beside you? James glanced at his baby sister, 
part of him wanting to talk to someone about the feelings pulsing through him, but he decided it was better not to. It would only cause more thoughts to rise up, instead of staying freshly buried under a mountain of regret and anger. Your silence, as well as the expression on your face, reveals much more than your tongue ever will, brother, Lizzie said, with a small yet satisfied smile. A ruckus came from the front of the manor, and James turned to the hallway. William rushed into the great hall and called out, Brother, come quick! What could be the problem now? What is the matter? Please, come see for yourself! William motioned James to hurry. James and Lizzie followed William, who held the door for them. As soon as James stepped outside, the pungent odour of rotting fruit filled his nostrils. He stopped dead in his tracks. On the front lawn of the estate lay a whole pile of broken and rotten fruit. The mound was swarming with flies. What the devil is the meaning of this? James demanded. The groundsman told me that he noticed a figure on the front lawn earlier, but he didn't think much of it, as he was under the impression that you still had guests, William explained. But why? Why target my estate? And with rotting fruit, James exclaimed in disgust. Who would do such a ridiculous thing? After a drawn-out moment of silent tension, James noticed Lizzie acting strangely, guilty even, and he approached her. Elizabeth, James said, and narrowed his eyes. Are you aware of who could have done this? I might be, Lizzie answered with a cringe. Tell me, James demanded, and William turned to her as well. Promise me you will not be angry, Lizzie said. James shook his head, clenching his hands into fists. I cannot promise you that, sister. Promise me, Lizzie begged. I will try my utmost not to be, if that helps, William said with a shrug. James glanced at William before he turned his attention back to Lizzie. Same, he grated. Now, tell me what is going on, sister. James glared at Lizzie. There had better be a good explanation for this disgusting mess on his lawn. Chapter 15 The sweet familiarity of her childhood home brought forth nothing more than a bitter taste in Kitty's mouth as she realised they would have to vacate the residence shortly. The townhouse had been in their family for generations, and it would be a heartbreaking torment to see it sold at auction. She stared out the window of her personal suite, a book lying open on her lap, but she paid it no attention. Instead, she stared at the dark brown coat that came to a halt in the street. Kitty was not certain who was inside, but in all honesty, she did not care. Her gaze simply landed upon it while her thoughts kept returning to Woodlock Manor. It had been a week since their departure from James's residence, but the memories lingered. Her heart did not ache any longer, and her eyes did not shed tears, but her mind still wandered. Through the meadow, down the hallways, and finally to James, where she had lain curled in his embrace sharing a bed, if only for one night. The faint sound of knocking on their front door spun her thoughts from the clouds, yet she didn't move. Someone else would answer. Perhaps it was the clergyman from the debt collector's office. Or the collector himself. Perhaps it was Mr. Cornish from the bank. Footsteps sounded, coming up the stairs and down the hallway, and Kitty's brow furrowed as there was a knock on her door. She turned her head as the door opened and saw her mother standing in the doorway. You have a visitor. In the front parlour. Who on earth would wish to visit me? Kitty inquired. I will have a pot of tea prepared. Do not keep your guest waiting, her mother answered sharply, before disappearing as speedily as she had arrived. That tone of voice from her mother didn't sound like good news. Kitty stood slowly, confused as she approached the door. Who could it be? She took a breath to compose herself, 
and left her bedchamber with no regard for her appearance. As she descended the narrow stairs, the voices from the parlour grew louder. She frowned. It wasn't James, and yet the voice sounded familiar. She walked closer and looked into the room. As soon as she saw the person standing in the parlour with her father, she stopped abruptly. Did her eyes deceive her? She blinked a few times, attempting to clear her vision, but nothing in the vision in front of her changed. Instead, the gentleman smiled brightly at her as he slowly approached. There was no doubt. Edward! Kitty gasped, shock causing her whole body to tremble. My lady! Lord Wyndham, whom Kitty had known her entire life as Edward, placed his hands against his chest and smiled at her. Your beauty astounds me, as always. Kitty breathed a sigh, but stood completely still. He was even more handsome than the last time she'd seen him. Is it not lovely to see Lord Wyndham again? I was very much surprised to see this strapping young man as I opened the front door. Her father beamed. Indeed, Kitty answered. I am surprised myself. And yet, she was not as happy as she expected to be. Lord Wyndham cocked his head. How are you, my lady? I am well. What on earth are you doing here, Edward? Kitty pursed her lips and corrected herself. My lord, I was under the impression you were still residing in the north. I am in the area tending to business for my father, and I saw Lady Dunn in town. She graciously invited me to dinner this evening. Surprise rippled through her. Really? She did, Kitty repeated, and turned to her father for clarification. It will certainly give us all a chance to hear what Lord Wyndham has been doing the past ten years, will it not, Kitty, her father said, obviously happy with the current turn of events. Kitty forced a smile and nodded. Certainly. Are you well, my lady? Does it shock you to see me in your home? Lord Wyndham inquired. Kitty lifted her chin, pushing away the melancholy that had consumed her for days. It has been a long while, my lord. I am merely surprised. It is lovely to see you. Edward chuckled happily. That is a relief. I did not wish to startle you. Your mother informed me that you received my last letter, Lord Wyndham said, his eyes wide and expectant. Kitty swallowed the lump that rose in her throat. Indeed I did. It was quite a letter. You certainly have a way with words, my lord. I meant every word, my lady. Kitty opened her mouth to respond, but at that moment her mother entered the room and jumped into the conversation. My goodness, Kitty! It seems as though you have seen a ghost. A ghost from her past, undoubtedly. Her father winked with amusement at his wife. Edward took a step toward them. Perhaps your daughter and I can come to some sort of agreement. Regarding what? Kitty asked. Edward turned to her, meeting her gaze with an intensity that shocked her. I would much rather say this to you in private, but I wish to marry you, Kitty. Kitty's jaw dropped, and her mother gasped beside her. Why on earth would you wish to marry me, my lord? Kitty, her father warned. It is quite all right, my lord, Lord Wyndham assured with a smile. I was certain Kitty wouldn't make it easy. After all, I was the one to leave all those years ago. But it was due to your father, Kitty's mother burst out. It does not matter, my lord, Kitty interrupted and turned to Lady Dunn. Mother, can I speak with you privately? My dear, we have a guest. I do not care, Kitty hissed as she brushed past her mother and exited the parlour. Lady Dunn followed her to the end of the hallway and Kitty turned to face her mother. You invited him to join us for dinner. Indeed? Why? she inquired, letting her annoyance show. 
Kitty, since you are no longer marrying Lord Seymour, I had to devise a plan for our family to survive. Lord Wyndham may not be the Duke, nor have his wealth and fortune, but his lordship has known you for a long while, as well as our family, and it would be foolish not to listen to his proposition. He can offer you a good life, Kitty, and your children will be beautiful. Kitty stared at her mother in disbelief and shook her head. No. Kitty! I will not marry him, mother. I do not wish to marry him, nor any other man whom you think would be able to save our family, Kitty stated. She had grown tired of her mother's insistence she marry someone whom she did not love, or even knew for that matter. Until she decided otherwise, the entire subject was off limits. Please, mother, respect my decision, Kitty added quietly, a wave of sadness washing over her. Her mother's lips pinched together. Lord Wyndham is here, and we will have a lovely dinner regardless. Is that clear? Lady Dunn said, then left Kitty alone in the hallway. Alone, with a broken heart, and a determination to make her own decisions for her future. At the dinner table later that evening, Kitty remained polite as she spoke to Lord Wyndham, insisting that he share the past ten years with her and her parents. Although she was aware of most of it, through letters Lord Wyndham had written to her, it was delightful, much to Kitty's surprise, to listen to his animated tales. Her old friend possessed a gift to tell a story so beautifully and with so much compelling language that even the blandest of tales sounded like the greatest adventure on earth. His dark brown eyes shone with delight as he glanced at her regularly. It was rather strange to Kitty that this handsome man, impeccably dressed in his formal attire, was the very boy beside whom she had spent many days running across fields of wildflowers, laughing while they ran for cover from the rain. Rain. A vivid memory of being in James's bed while heavy rain drummed against the window flashed in her mind, and her body froze. Anger rose up inside her. She would not be able to think of anything except her night with James when she heard rain outside now. Is everything well, my lady? Lord Wyndham inquired, and his voice whirled her back to the present moment. Kitty glanced at him and noticed her parents' stares were also fixed on her. I am perfectly well, my lord. I was merely thinking of something. What could possibly be on your mind that causes you to be this distracted? Kitty, you seem to be across the world. In all honesty, Kitty wished she were. In fact, she wished to be anywhere but the place where she found herself presently. I merely have a few trivial things on my mind. Not to worry, my lord. It is nothing to concern yourself with, Kitty stated. Pardon me for a moment. Kitty stood from her seat and quietly left the dining room. Her chest ached as her heart was yet again betrayed by the memory she'd attempted to forget. Her mother and father had disappointed her tonight. They were well aware, from her harsh words and her tears on their journey home from Woodlock Manor, that she never wished to have anything to do with any man ever again. They still only thought of themselves. She entered the study and opened the large window, allowing the cool, fresh air to flow into the room. She took slow, deep breaths, attempting to calm the storm inside her heart. Alas, it did not work. A soft knock on the door caused her to sigh wearily. Please, mother, leave me be. Have you not tortured me enough this past week? My lady. Lord Wyndham's voice inside the room made her jump and she whirled around. My apologies, my lord. I was under the impression it was my mother. There is no need to apologize. It was rather unmannerly of me to simply assume you would allow me to speak with you privately, Lord Wyndham said, and slowly approached Kitty. I am truly sorry you have been tortured by Lady Dunn. Kitty scoffed and shook her head. She seems to enjoy it. If I may ask, 
What is the reason she torments you, my lady? Kitty sighed. It is a rather long and tediously tiresome tale. I wish to know. I would rather not say, my lord, Kitty answered with a frown and walked past Lord Wyndham. Much to her surprise, Lord Wyndham's hand reached out to grasp her arm, yanking her backwards. She gasped as she turned her head to Lord Wyndham. His dark brown eyes darkened even more. Oh, I insist, my lady, he said, and for the first time she realised his gaze was filled with malice rather than affection. Chapter 16 Lizzie pursed her lips, obviously attempting to suppress the tears that had already started to form in her eyes. James's gaze was focused solely on her, and with every moment that passed and she did not utter a word, he grew angrier. Elizabeth, tell me now, James exclaimed. Calm yourself, brother, William said, but Lizzie shook her head. Do not scold him, William. James has every right to be angered by what I have done and what led to this awful situation. A tear ran down her cheek. Tell us, Elizabeth, William insisted. Lizzie drew in a slow, deep breath and glanced at James. You were right in regards to Lord Dorset. James narrowed his eyes at Lizzie. There was clearly more to this story, but he sensed that if he pushed her too hard, Lizzie would clam up once and for all. At last she sighed. He is a rake, and I should not have wasted my time on a man such as that. I was under the impression he loved me, cared for my feelings and respected me, Lizzie whispered. A man like Dorset does not respect any person, let alone a woman whom he uses as he sees fit and discards after he's gotten what he wanted from her, William said. Quiet, James ordered, and motioned to Lizzie to continue. Lizzie nodded gratefully and cleared her throat. Lord Dorset promised it was different with me and convinced me that he had feelings for me. I was a fool because I believed him. I was too infatuated with Lord Dorset and too blinded by his charms, so I failed to notice anything else. What did he do to you, sister? James asked surprisingly calm considering the situation. His heart pounded in his chest and his jaw tightened with each moment, but he kept a hold on the reins of his temper while he could. He needed to know the full story. It is not what you think, James, but it is rather unpleasant, she answered. Well, thank God for that. Tell me. I accompanied him for a stroll in the park last week, which I considered a wonderful opportunity, as it was a public place, hence people were able to see us together. I thought it was a step in the right direction for the two of us. Being seen in public meant he was serious and wished for people to know about us, Lizzie said. Bitterness twisted her lips. But it was only for show. As soon as we reached the border of the park, he led me through the trees, where no person was able to see us. He spoke soft words in my ear as his hands grazed over my body. I was delighted as his affectionate touch proved to me that he had changed. Lord Dorset then proceeded to kiss me. Is it necessary for such intimate details? William asked with a growl. James agreed. He'd heard more than enough. Did he do anything that warrants me beating him to a pulp? Not in the manner in which you think, brother, Lizzie answered. When things became too heated, I brushed him off, as I did not feel it was appropriate. He grew angry and stormed off. I was embarrassed and ashamed, and as I left the park on my own, Lord Dorset was nowhere in sight. James pursed his lips and waited for Lizzie to continue, although he had already deduced the issue. I attended Lady Bisterham's ball at her lavish estate. I received the most gawking and judgmental glances from people whom I considered close acquaintances, as well as others whom I had never met. Their whispers grew louder, and I overheard one of them say that Lord Dorset and I had shared a bed numerous times. 
did you? James inquired, simply to be certain. Lizzie's eyes grew wide. Of course not, James. They are spreading lies about me, and soon my reputation will be ruined, if it is not already, Lizzie answered, the dismay evident on her face. I cannot believe you questioned me with regards to that. I simply had to be certain, sister, James answered. Nevertheless, people now think I am a light-skirted woman, thanks to Lord Dorset. Hence, the reason I have been hiding myself away in the manor. I do not wish to be the subject of people's gossip or judgment. And the fruit? William asked with a furrowed brow. It is a way to express distaste for Elizabeth. She is rotten and spoiled and no man should go anywhere near her. Rotten fruit. It is the perfect metaphor, James answered absent-mindedly. Indeed, Lizzie said and turned away from her brothers. I certainly did not consider it being such a momentous thing. It is a rather outlandish act, do you not think, James? But James did not hear any of the words from Lizzie's mouth. He pressed his thumb against his chin and pondered what could be done in regards to this situation. James could not allow his sister's reputation to be wrongfully tainted and ruined by a man who possessed a reputation for being a rake. His thoughts immediately turned to Kitty. He hoped that her reputation was still intact. The last thing Kitty needed was rotten fruit flung at her family's home. James hoped that she was doing well and had forgotten about him and the night they shared together in his chambers, even though it was never far from his mind. He thought of it every night as he lay and stared at the empty space in his bed where she had lain in his arms. She had fit so perfectly in his embrace. He felt empty and not complete now that she was gone. James heard Lizzie repeatedly uttering his name, more desperate with each passing moment. He had to take a stand on behalf of his sister. He turned to Lizzie, who was nearly frantic. James, please answer me, Lizzie insisted. My humblest of pardons, sister. What was it you asked? he said apologetically. I am not certain what to do, James. Lizzie's tone was desperate and filled with guilt. I did not think he would do such a thing to me, but I was foolish. I am sincerely sorry for allowing myself to be swept away by a man such as Lord Dorset. You and William warned me about him, yet I was under the impression that I was able to take care of myself. I am a stubborn woman, and I probably deserve all the malicious things that are to happen to me because of it. Lizzie hung her head with a sob, and James's heart broke. What a fragile thing a woman's reputation was. Nonsense! You are our sister, and we will do everything in our power to ensure this does not become an issue, William stated. True, brother? William glanced hopefully at James, who continued to stare at Lizzie. Lizzie raised her brow expectantly. James? Lizzie whispered. The things people are saying are untrue, James asked, needing to make sure that he was correct before he ventured forward. Yes. All of it, James emphasized. One kiss. That was all I permitted. I vow to you, brother, Lizzie said, her eyes wide and guileless. Very well. I will put an end to this matter once and for all. James said, and looked toward William. Have my coach readied immediately. What will you do? Lizzie grabbed hold of James's arm. James glanced at her and grinned, his gut tight with tension. I am saving your reputation. Please do not question how I will accomplish it. Just know that it will be done. You are not set on murdering Lord Dorset, are you? Lizzie asked with tears glistening in her eyes. If it comes to that, then so be it, James answered, and freed himself from her grasp. And have the servants clean up that ungodly mess. James, wait! Lizzie's voice sounded frantic, but he did not turn around. 
he was well aware that he could never truly murder someone, not even when that person was set on ruining an innocent young lady's life. Despite knowing that Lizzie was not, in fact, as innocent as most people might think, it did not matter. Spreading rumours and falsehoods of people was wrong, even when it did not involve his family. James had always been quick to put a stop to gossip while people were in his presence. He cared not for the sensationalism that rumours and lies caused, and people were well aware of that. James marched into the manor house and called for his coat. A servant retrieved it from the parlour and helped him put it on. When he stepped outside again, his coach was ready. He approached the coach, but Lizzie ran toward him. James, please, listen to me. There is no need to put your life at risk. Sister, you asked me to assist you, and that is precisely what I am doing. I am not murdering anyone, so leave me be, James said. Lizzie raised her hands in defeat and stepped away, allowing him to climb into the coach. James glanced out of the window and simply nodded at his siblings before the coach began to move and he left the estate. James pounded his fist against the wooden door of an address he knew all too well, his anger building inside him. The door opened after a few moments and a butler stared at him. Your Grace? He bowed. Get Lord Dorset for me. The butler nodded, and within a few moments, a dishevelled Lord Dorset stood before him. Your Grace, Lord Dorset chimed with a smile. How lovely it is to see. Before the rake set on ruining his sister was able to complete his greeting, James punched the arrogant Lord in the face. He stumbled backward and fell to the ground. James reached down grabbed him by the collar of his shirt and dragged him outside, where several people began gawking at the ruckus. Unhand me, you brute! Dorset struggled against James's grasp, but James threw him down on the ground. How dare you drag my sister and my family's name through the mud! Spreading lies about her purity and her character as a young woman is untrue and unforgivable, James growled. Your sister is the one spreading lies, as she does with her legs. Even lying on the ground, Lord Dorset grinned smugly. James knelt and punched Lord Dorset once more. The man groaned as blood trickled from the corner of his mouth. You are a liar, and you will set this straight, James said. I will not allow you to ruin my sister's reputation, because she wouldn't become another notch on your bedpost. James grabbed Dorset's collar and stood, forcing the man into a standing position. He glanced around at the crowd forming around them. Tell everyone here how you spread lies about my sister, James ordered. I will not. Lord Dorset spat, blood trickling down his chin. Tell them, James yelled and tightened his grasp around the cad's throat. Lord Dorset gasped for a few moments until he panted. Very well. I never laid a finger on her. Everything I said was untrue. It was only to boast of another conquest. The people who had come closer to witness Lord Dorset's confession gasped and whispered amongst themselves. James turned to Lord Dorset and snarled. If you ever go near my sister, or any other young woman whom you attempt to ruin, I will tear you limb from limb and feed you to the dogs. Is that clear? Yes, Lord Dorset whispered. James released Dorset from his grasp and the man fell to the ground, groaning at the impact. James stepped away and walked back to his coach without another word. He glanced intently at the people on the street who had witnessed his altercation with Lord Dorset. To clear matters up, James announced to the spectators, as I am certain there will be many tales circulating with regard to this incident, let it be known that Lord Dorset is a rake. He ruins women by promising them the moon and stars, then discards them as soon as he has gotten what he wanted from them. Those who oppose him and reject him, he smears their names, as he did with my sister. That will not happen again. 
Keep your daughters and your sisters away from this man, as he is more worthless than a street rat. James turned and climbed into his coach, not the least bit interested in the murmurs behind him. He had done what he came to do, and that was the end of it. Chapter 17 Kitty stared into Lord Wyndham's eyes, and her blood froze in her veins. Despite his outward appearance being the same as it had always been, there was a sudden and evil darkness emanating from deep within the man she had considered a childhood friend. Kitty was unable to move as fear pulsed through her. My lady, your mother wishes the best for her only daughter, and who am I to argue with that? She did, in fact, invite me to dinner, so desperate was she for me to marry you, Lord Wyndham sneered. His tone made Kitty straighten her spine and find her tongue. He thought he'd won, did he? My mother is under the impression she knows what is best for me, Kitty answered, struggling against Edward's grasp. Now please, unhand me at once. He glared at her, then loosened his grip abruptly, stepping away from Kitty as though disgusted. What happened to you, Edward? Kitty whispered. You are not the man I remember. Many things change in a decade, my dear. You of all people should be aware of that, Edward answered and paced around the room. While I was adapting to my new life in the North, there was not a day that passed when I did not think of you. I wondered what you were doing and why you'd forgotten me. He sounded hurt, which did not correlate with the scary behavior from a moment ago. My lord, you were a very large part of my life, and I could not simply forget you. Then why did you? he inquired, as he stopped abruptly in the centre of the room. I didn't, Kitty said, shaking her head. Of all the people your mother could have chosen, she chose James of Somerset, he spat. Kitty's mouth dropped open. What did Edward have against James? He was the wealthiest prospect, and according to her, our children would be very handsome, Kitty said, her heart constricting at the thought of James. Despite her inability to ever admit it to anyone, even herself, she missed the Duke desperately. She still spent every night staring out her window, hoping James would come to her rescue, now more than ever. Did she not think I was good enough for you? It was only after the Duke rejected you that she found it in her heart to consider me. Edward glanced in Kitty's direction. It was not James who rejected me, my lord. It was I who rejected him, Kitty pointed out. Lord Wyndham cocked his head. Why is that? I could not marry a man such as him, regardless of how wealthy he is. Wealth does not excuse a heart of stone. Perhaps she had been callous in her decision to accuse James of not being a man she could marry. Had she been unreasonable and too quick to judge him? Perhaps James had been meaning to send for an animal doctor to examine and treat Lord Windsor, but had not had the time to do so. He was a duke with all the obligations the title carried and entertaining her family at the time. Her stomach tightened as the thought took hold. Perhaps she had jumped to conclusions too soon. Her heart ached for James, his touch, his kiss. Kitty! Edward's voice called her back to the present, where she had little desire to be. Kitty now knew why Edward had visited. Her mother had practically begged him to visit and join them for dinner. Her mother had grown desperate after the termination of the arrangement with James. Lady Dunn had sought out desperate measures to keep their family from financial destruction with absolutely no thought to Kitty's happiness. Sadly, Kitty's well-being had never been a factor, at least not to her mother. She had always simply followed along with whatever notion her mother wished or had single-handedly decided. Terminating the arrangement with James had shocked her mother, obviously, 
but now that she had adjusted course to come to terms with Edward, there would be no stopping the formidable Lady Dunn. Kitty had no say in the matter, of course, but she did not feel angered or betrayed. She simply felt terrified. Edward was not here because he loved her. He was here for revenge. Against her, for never responding to his letters. And her parents, for never thinking he was good enough. Not until she'd been rejected by a duke. That would not bode well for a marriage that would last a lifetime. Are you well, Kitty? Edward inquired. You seem lost in your thoughts. Not at all, my lord. You were thinking of James. Edward's eyes darkened suddenly. I was not, she snapped back, not interested in his temper. I was thinking of my mother and how she enjoys manipulating those around her. And why would you say such a thing? he asked, calm once more. She hid your letters from me. Were you aware of that? Kitty said. She did not wish for me to know how you felt. She was afraid that it would make me change my mind or jeopardize their arrangement with James. But that happened regardless. Are you happy you did not end up marrying the Duke? She nodded, though her chest tightened and her throat burned. Of course. It was what we both wanted. You seem hesitant in your answer, he countered. Kitty frowned at the man before her. She had outgrown her childhood friend, it seemed, and she no longer wanted anything to do with him. I am merely finding this conversation tiresome. Marriage is a matter I do not wish to discuss any longer. Kitty sighed. I must apologize, my lord, but despite being close acquaintances with you since we were children, I do not desire to marry you, or anyone for that matter. I am exhausted and overwhelmed, especially given the fact that my father is losing all his money due to embezzlements by his business partner, Lord Wyndham interrupted, and Kitty's eyes widened. He knew about that, and yet he still wanted to marry her. Before she could answer, however, he continued, I am aware of many things involving you and your family, my dearest Kitty. It is rather unsettling, Kitty admitted openly, and shrugged her shoulders in discomfort. And so was the fact that he had kept a personal eye on her and her family. Well, imagine how I must feel knowing that you shared a bed with James, he said, his eyes narrowing. Kitty inhaled sharply, fear quickening her stomach. You must be mistaken. Do not attempt to lie to me, Kitty. I know it is true. I knew it the moment I saw you enter your father's parlour. You are different now, and I do not approve. Who was he to approve of her or not? This is who I am now. I am not here to please any man, ever again. Much to her shock, Edward grabbed her arm once more and pulled her close to him, but not in an affectionate manner. His eyes grew dark, and his lips thinned into an evil smirk. My lady, I am not a disrespectful man, but listen to me. If you think for a single moment that you have a choice in this matter, you are wrong. I have already arranged the marriage with your father, and we will both honour it. Never, Kitty hissed. Lord Wyndham's grasp tightened, but Kitty stared at him. My lord, you are a weak-minded man, and if you think your violence will have any impact on me or my decisions, you are a fool. You will do as I say, or I will reveal to all of society that you lost your innocence to the Duke and are no longer a respected member of society. Your reputation will be ruined, and you will be forced to roam the streets as a light skirt, allowing men to have their way with you for a simple coin, if you are worth that much, Edward snarled. Your parents will sleep in the streets with the rats and perish like the worthless animals they will become. Tears formed in her eyes as Edward's cruel words suffocated the life out of her. She stood silently, 
staring at him, her heart shattering into a million shards. How was it possible that her childhood friend had become such a vicious and vindictive person? Her heart ached for the child she had known and cared for, but she did not care at all for the cruel man standing before her now. Kitty could still live with a tainted and ruined reputation, but she could not allow her parents to live among the rats and perish in such a manner. Now was the time to stop being selfish, to cast her own interest into the fire and allow it to burn. Her family required her assistance and cooperation. Very well, my lord, Kitty breathed, then shuddered as she said, I will marry you and serve you as a wife should a husband. A smirk formed on his mouth, and he said with a satisfied tone, I am delighted you see it my way. I do apologise for my resistance, my lord, Kitty forced herself to say, fearing what sort of retribution would come in the future when he was legally able to do what he wanted with her. It is your fire that I always adored about you, my lady, Edward whispered as he tenderly stroked her cheek. A rush of disgust surged over Kitty, but she kept her composure, simply nodding at him. Perhaps we should rejoin my parents for the remaining portion of dinner. Would you not agree? Indeed, he answered. You and I will have the rest of our lives together. Chapter 18 I can't believe my knuckles are still bruised, James said, as Lizzie wrapped his hand in a bandage soaked with alcohol. I still cannot believe you punched him. Lizzie said, her tone annoyed and yet full of pride. Several times, James pointed out, with a painful wince. That hurts, Elizabeth. Lizzie glanced at him apologetically and continued wrapping his hand. I cannot believe you threw a punch that actually made him bleed, William chuckled. Where did you learn to be such a brute? When the reputation of someone you love is at stake, even the gentlest person can become a fighter, James said, not regretting his actions for a moment. Indeed, and I appreciate it more than I will ever be able to express, Lizzie said. I only wish I'd been there to see it for myself. Thank you, brother. You do not need to thank me, James said quietly, meeting his sister's gaze and smiling at her. William went on. It's wrong to spread untruths about another person for your own personal gain. It astounds me that he was under the impression he was going to get away with it. But James, you took care of him in front of a crowd as well. Dorset was certainly not expecting that. Even though you did it for Elizabeth, you are now my hero. James grew quiet and lowered his gaze, wincing one last time, as Lizzie finished wrapping the bandage around his hand. Brother, Lizzie whispered and touched James's chin. Are you well? It is not only my hand that is bruised, Elizabeth. Did Lord Dorset hit you? Where? Lizzie inquired and examined him briefly. No, it wasn't Lord Dorset. This was caused by my own hand, James said. I don't understand. Lizzie answered with a furrowed brow. James sighed wearily. He'd come to this decision earlier, but it was more difficult to say aloud than he'd originally thought it would be. He took a breath and braved the dragon. I wish to make amends with Kitty. Lizzie gasped. I was under the impression she made you miserable, William scoffed. Their sister whirled on him. Can you not see? He is even more miserable without Kitty, Lizzie snarled at William. I was never truly miserable with her, James pointed out and glanced at his sister. I wish she was here with me right this moment. I wish I had the courage to say all the things I still carry within me that I was given the chance to say and chose not to because of my own cowardice. Which things? Lizzie inquired her eyes sparkling with hope. Oh, God, he had to say it. Aloud. Right now. 
think of it as practice before the real thing with Kitty. I am in love with her, Elizabeth. I must be. I cannot stop thinking of her. The entire estate reminds me of moments with her. I spend my days thinking of her, and I spend my nights wishing I had not told her to leave. She left on her own, James, William pointed out. The young lady could have stayed if she wanted. James shook his head. That was incorrect. No, I told her to leave and to never come back. That she was no longer welcome here. James sighed, feelings of guilt and remorse welling up inside him. I said terrible things to her. I was such a fool, chasing away the only person I wanted near me. James, Lizzie sighed and placed her free hand on his arm. If I could merely tell her that I am sorry and I wish for her to come back. Lizzie glanced at William over her shoulder and bit her lower lip. William exhaled and turned away, avoiding James's eyes. What is it? James asked and glanced at Lizzie. He shifted away from her, his hand out of her grasp, and she glanced at him intently. There is something you must know, James, Lizzie said quietly. What is it, Elizabeth? James asked once more, his tone filled with more urgency than before. Kitty is already betrothed to another, Lizzie answered carefully. What? James exclaimed and jumped up from the low stool, gaping down at Lizzie. Kitty is betrothed to Lord Wyndham, Lizzie repeated with more clarification and stood as well. Since when? James demanded. How was that possible? It has only been a couple of days. Lady Josephine, a mutual friend, spoke to me during our visit at the tea house, Lizzie explained. And you were under the impression that you shouldn't inform me of this? James ran his hand through his hair, frustration twisting his gut. I only wish to protect you, James, Lizzie insisted. I do not require your protection. I am a grown man. With the heart of a boy, Lizzie interjected. James stopped and stared at his sister angrily, his jaw clenched. How dare she say such a thing? Your heart was fragile after Lady Penelope, and as much as you wish to deny it, her actions still affect you. I see it in every single choice you make, even with regards to Kitty. Lizzie smiled gently. I understand that you are upset, but it is better this way. She is betrothed, and you cannot walk back into her life and disturb everything. James clenched his jaw and lowered his gaze. It seemed that Lizzie knew him better than he knew himself. Yet something stirred inside him, something new. There was a powerful shift in his heart. His courage rose up inside him, and his shoulders straightened. No. What do you mean, no? William inquired, his face filled with confusion, as was Lizzie's. No. I cannot allow Kitty to marry that man. He is not right for her. She is not meant to be with him. She was meant to be his wife. No other man would suit her the way he did. You don't even know the man. How can you make such assumptions? William scoffed, but a smile formed on Lizzie's lips. I am the man Kitty is meant to be with, James announced. I have been licking my wounds for far too long. What are you going to do? William asked, his eyes wide with surprise. Don't fret. There won't be any violence involved, or at least none that I intend, James assured his brother. Before you go, brother, William said suddenly, are you certain this is the right thing to do? James glanced at his brother and narrowed his eyes. William shrugged. Think it over, please. No. Enough thinking. It is time for me to be the man she deserves. A man she can depend upon. I cannot simply give in. 
Kitty means too much to me to let her go. And if she does not reciprocate your feelings, Lizzie inquired. James glanced at his siblings. Better to be hurt again than regret in action. At least then I will know her true feelings. Perhaps, but it will leave you shattered beyond repair, just as you were when Lady Penelope. James waved his hand to stop Lizzie from spouting off any more of her unwanted opinions. Lady Penelope pretended to be someone she was not. She deceived me and used me for her own personal gain. There was not a moment where Kitty acted unlike herself. She was honest with me from the moment I met her, and she never pretended to be someone whom she was not. No woman will ever have my heart as she does. That is obvious, Lizzie whispered. Indeed. James sighed, letting some of the tension leach out of his system. Go to her, brother, Lizzie encouraged him. Go to her and tell her all these things you told us. Pour your heart out to her. Tell her how you feel. No woman who willingly gives herself intimately to a man deserves to marry another simply for the sake of her family. James glanced at her and cocked his head. How did she know? No one told me. I could see it in her eyes, Lizzie assured him, and James nodded at her. Now go, before it is too late. As James swiftly left the parlour, Lizzie turned to William. You did not tell him, William pointed out with a scowl. I was not the one from whom he needed to hear it. That is now in Kitty's hands. Lizzie turned away and gathered her medical supplies from the table. Chapter 19 Kitty reached out and touched the delicate petals of the white flowers that grew in her mother's garden. Despite the space being very small, with only a few flowers and plants, Kitty often retreated there for solace and to have a few moments to herself. Those moments, however, could often last hours, and most times it was her father who would prompt her to come inside. Today, he was nowhere in sight. Perhaps he had seen the expression on her face as she and her fiancé had re-entered the dining room, or noticed the fingerprints on her arms caused by Edward's hand. Could he have noticed her newfound passivity to everything Edward said? If he did not realise it was a silent cry for help, her father did not know her very well. Kitty sighed wearily as she leaned back and rested her head against the wooden fence and closed her eyes for a moment, awaiting her father's arrival. Despite trying to be strong for her family, grief welled up inside of her and she began to quietly cry. This was not the life she had imagined for herself, not even as a young child. She had often dreamt of meeting a wonderful man, whom she had once hoped would be Edward, but after she'd accepted his proposal, she had soon realised that the boy of her dreams had turned into the man of her nightmares. Footsteps along the path that led around the side of the townhouse toward the garden caused her to open her eyes and wipe the tears from her face. She did not wish for her father to see her cry, as it would only worsen matters. The wrought iron gate unlatched, and as she glanced up, her heart thumped against her chest with wild recognition. Your Grace, Kitty said. What on earth are you doing here? Good afternoon, my lady. He bowed stiffly, and she curtsied in response. Lovely to see you, Kitty responded automatically. James chuckled and answered, We're both aware that is not true. For the first time in too long, her lips tugged up into a smile. I choose not to respond to that. Perhaps it is better that way, he said. What are you doing here? I was under the impression you didn't wish to see me again, whether it be at Woodlock Manor or anywhere else, Kitty said. James's presence was overwhelming to her already devastated nerves, and she had to fight with all her inner strength not to faint or cry. 
Is it true? Are you betrothed to Lord Wyndham? James inquired. Kitty gasped. How do you know of that? My sister informed me. It seems that she and my brother learned about it, and they didn't think I should be made aware of it, James answered. It didn't take you long to find another suitor, which is rather alarming. She stepped closer, surprised by his statement. Why is that alarming? It gives me reason to believe that you have an urgency to marry. Am I correct? Kitty sighed. Your Grace, with all due respect, you don't know me, my situation, nor the reason why I am betrothed to Lord Wyndham so quickly after our arrangement was terminated, Kitty stated, desperately fighting back the tears that stung her eyes. Why would it matter to you? You chased me from your estate, warning me never to return. James sucked in a visible breath. I was angered that you wished to end our betrothal, especially after... After we shared a night together that meant absolutely nothing, Kitty bit out, struggling to keep the bitterness from her voice. She'd given James her virginity, her maidenhead. It had meant everything to her. It meant something to me, my lady, James corrected softly. It was nice to hear him say the words, but her stomach twisted with anger. You do not need to feel any remorse for what happened that night, Your Grace. It has not ruined me as a person, nor tarnished my soul. Although Edward was never going to let her forget it. But your heart has seen better days, James pointed out. As has mine. Now she wanted to scream and escape his presence before she burst into tears. Is that why you came here? To tell me that you're feeling terrible for upsetting me because you feel guilty? Kitty asked. No, I didn't come here out of guilt. Then what? Kitty exclaimed, growing more frustrated by the minute. He is not the right man for you, Kitty, James said. And you are? Kitty said, raising her eyebrows in question. James nodded. In fact, I am. Oh, my lord. That is utterly ridiculous. You proved to yourself, and proved to me, that you are not, Kitty scoffed. But I am. You intrigued me the moment I set eyes on you. You were not what I expected. You made me feel alive for the first time in a very long time. Your heart is kind and generous, and although you tend to please others before yourself, you are who you are. You do not compromise your integrity for anyone. Your love for my horses was heartwarming, and I would have you know I sent for an animal doctor, and Lord Windsor is doing much better. He is eating and drinking and thriving. A smile formed on her face, and a tear ran down her cheek. That is good to hear. I am certain he would love for you to visit him, James stated. Kitty cocked her head to the side, confused by this sudden turn. I thought I was no longer welcome at your estate. We both know I didn't mean it. Just as you didn't mean to end our arrangement. So confident of how we both feel. Since when? Kitty sighed. She didn't have the strength for this conversation. You can't do this. Not here, Your Grace. Not now. I am betrothed to Lord Wyndham. I can't. She turned away before her tears got the better of her. You can simply end your betrothal with him. I wish it were that simple, Your Grace, Kitty whispered. Why is it not? James asked. Kitty didn't answer. She couldn't. James would hate her if he knew the truth about how much she was sacrificing now. He thought she was strong, but she wasn't. My, oh my. Both Kitty and James turned at the snide voice. Edward stood beside the gate, glaring at them. Your Grace, lovely to see you. Edward sneered with a mock half-bow. I wish I could reciprocate those feelings, 
James answered dryly. Have you come to congratulate Kitty and myself on our pending nuptials, Your Grace? Edward asked with a smirk. You and I both know that is not why I'm here, James said, and straightened his shoulders. Strangely, he stepped in front of Kitty, as if to shield her from any kind of attack. While Kitty appreciated the unexpected gesture of chivalry, she immediately dismissed it, stepping to the side to better watch the exchange between the two men. Then why precisely are you here? Edward asked, glaring at James. Not that it is any of your business, but I have come to release Kitty from your arrangement, James answered. I am afraid that is not possible. Our wedding has already been scheduled. Cancel it, James ordered. Kitty gaped. James was serious. This new, decisive version of the man who had captured her heart was rather surprising, in a good way. There is nothing you can say that would make me back away from this arrangement, Your Grace, Lord Wyndham pointed out, crossing his arms. Name your price, James answered. There is no amount of coin that can make me change my mind. Are you certain of that? I am very wealthy, and I can certainly make you disappear from the face of this earth for less. Kitty put a hand over her mouth to stifle a gasp. James was willing to pay Edward to leave. Are you certain you wish to do that, Your Grace? Waste all that money on a woman who keeps secrets from you? Edward asked. Kitty and I have no secrets from one another, James answered with the utmost confidence. Edward looked at Kitty. Perhaps you wish to inform him of the true reason your parents needed you to marry the Duke of Somerset, my lady, Edward suggested wickedly. Kitty's heart, which had been beating heavily, began to thud painfully. How had she never seen the ugliness beneath the facade of Edward's handsome face? He was a truly despicable man, and she was supposed to marry him. What does he speak of, my lady? James inquired, and turned to look at Kitty. She pressed her lips together, but was unable to utter a word. She couldn't bear to see the disappointment and revulsion in James's face when he learned the truth. James turned back to Edward. Perhaps this is a good opportunity for you to leave. I will ensure you receive a generous amount to stay as far away from Kitty as possible. James said, in a firm and authoritative tone. This is not over, Edward sneered. The Seymour family is under the impression they may do as they please, but that will soon change. I do not take threats lightly, my lord, James growled. Edward narrowed his eyes before turning to leave the small garden. The creaking sound of the gate closing caused Kitty to cringe. James turned back to Kitty. What did he mean, Kitty? She realized that now was the moment to speak. She couldn't keep James in the dark any longer. She clutched her hands together. You didn't have to do that, James. It is because of the very thing Edward spoke of that we are in such a predicament. She automatically reverted to the use of his name when he used hers. He mentioned the true reason we were to be wed. He raised an eyebrow as he awaited her response. Lord Wyndham is correct. There is something you must be made aware of, James. Kitty bit her lip, wondering how best to spell out her family's ruination. Tell me. Kitty put a hand on the nearby fence, needing something sturdy to hold on to. I am not certain it is what you wish to hear. I do not wish to upset you, which I've done more than enough times now. There is not a thing you can confess that would upset me, Kitty, the Duke declared. She wasn't entirely sure about that. But nevertheless, she had no choice but to press on. She inhaled slowly through her nose and then let out her breath in a rush. When my father approached you to speak with you regarding his proposition, he was not certain whether you would agree to another meeting. My father was careful, riddled with concern that you would call him out to be daft. 
He was delighted when you agreed to the marriage, as was my mother. I, on the other hand, was not. I felt like a pawn being used to fix a mistake that had come across their path. I had no choice in the matter. I was simply dragged along to do their bidding. James's eyebrows furrowed deeply. I do not understand. Kitty's stomach twisted with nerves, but she trudged on. You will soon. You see, my father's business partner was caught embezzling money from their company, and it has left my father's financial situation in ruin. Marrying you, a wealthy and attractive man who wished never to fall in love, was seen as perfect by my parents. It would prevent my family from living on the streets. You only agreed because I was wealthy. James's brows came down in a scowl. I did not agree to anything. I was forced into it, Kitty contended. James sighed. So it is your parents who are the villains in this piece. Kitty bit her lip. Will you forgive them? James nodded. Of course. Arranged marriages are often about security and finances. I only wish they'd been more upfront about their true motives. Kitty forced out a laugh. A marriage is a most advantageous connection. You would get someone young and sturdy to provide you with heirs, and I, well, my parents, I suppose, would get to keep from financial ruin. James's lips lifted into a smile. Just so. Her eyes widened. He didn't seem as upset as she had expected. In fact, he didn't seem upset at all. Instead, he simply stared at her, his gaze intense. And you, Kitty? Me? Yes. Is our arrangement now only palatable to you if it means saving your family? It is obvious that is the only reason you were putting up with that other chap. He nodded his head in the direction Edward had gone. Oh, no. Kitty shook her head. I admit it was that way at the start. I had to behave perfectly in order to impress you, to save my family. But then... Then what? James asked, stepping forward. Then you took me to the meadow where we had our race. When I became better acquainted with you, something rose up inside me. I was comfortable with you, and it wasn't because of the money. I was under the impression I had lost my mind, Kitty explained, shaking her head. But I simply lost my heart. To you, James. His eyes bored into her, as if trying to see right through to her core. You had. Indeed. I was convinced it was impossible for a person, especially myself, to fall in love as quickly as I had. That night in your bedchamber, Kitty. Please, allow me to finish, Kitty demanded, and James nodded in acknowledgement. That night I saw a different side of you. Sensitive, vulnerable, and I saw those walls you've erected around your heart come tumbling down. The way you stared into my eyes, the tender manner in which you kissed me, it changed everything. I knew then it was more than a mere arrangement, for you as well as me. Kitty's cheeks heated. It was difficult to share her intimate feelings, but she had to show him how she felt. Those feelings never truly stopped, not even after I told you I couldn't marry a man who does not care for horses, or who lies. I think I was simply overwhelmed by the strength of my feelings, and not certain how to properly deal with them. I do apologise for all those terrible things I said. I deserved them, James admitted. I said terrible things too, and for that I apologise, my lady. I'm not a perfect person, and I do not claim to be. I make mistakes. We all do, she interjected. But the biggest mistake was to allow you to leave my estate. I fought with myself as I watched you standing by the coach. I desperately wished to stop you from leaving, but I was afraid. Afraid you did not reciprocate my feelings. Afraid I might get hurt again. 
I would never hurt you like that, James, Kitty answered, and reached out her hand to him. He clasped it tightly. I am aware of that now. Kitty smiled. Tell me what happened with the other woman. Lady Penelope, James asked, and as Kitty nodded, his jaw clenched. There was a beat of silence. I met her in town, he said, after a pause. Her father was a Marquess, a very respected man, but also a gambling man. He was in trouble with a few people. He owed them money, quite a large amount. Lady Penelope assumed the identity of someone other than his daughter. He stopped and sighed, so she waited. I was not acquainted with her, or had even seen her from a distance, but she introduced herself as Lady Penelope. She merely used me for my wealth, to steal from me, and I allowed it. I fell for her lies, and it cost me dearly. I would never do that to you, James. I vow to you, Kitty whispered. Even if you were the poorest man in the world, it would not matter to me. It is you I fell in love with. And I you, Kitty, James whispered as he leaned in and tenderly took her lips in a kiss that stole away her breath. Chapter 20 The sweet scent of the white flowers that grew in the small garden at her parents' townhouse filled the air around Kitty. One of the servants had woven some of the flowers through her hair into a crown, especially for their garden wedding celebration, and it was a perfect day. Kitty inhaled deeply as the scent engulfed her, allowing her to beam happily at her new husband, James of Somerset, who stood across the lawn, speaking to his brother William and another lord. Her white muslin gown blew gracefully in the light breeze, the material brushing against her skin. Opting to keep her hair loose had been a trying topic, especially between Kitty and her mother, but Kitty had gotten her way in the end. It was her and James's special day, and she could not be more thrilled at how it had turned out. After three months, which seemed to fly by in a whirlwind of balls and social events, their engagement announcement, the planning of their wedding, as well as the new partnership James had entered to with her father to save the family business, things had become less strained overall. Kitty was unfamiliar with her new title as the Duchess of Somerset, but James promised to help her ease into the role and her new responsibilities as a titled lady. It was a perfect autumn day, the blue sky in magnificent contrast to the orange and red colours of the season. The private garden of the late Duke had been opened and adorned with white flowers and ribbons, with delectable treats served by a bevy of maids. The guests conversed pleasantly, and Kitty smiled, enjoying the lovely sight before her. Pardon the intrusion, Your Grace, a female voice said beside her, and Kitty turned toward her new sister-in-law. Elizabeth, Kitty smiled. There is no need for such formalities, please. Only in public, I swear. It is something one must become accustomed to. Lizzie shrugged nonchalantly. How are you feeling? Much better, I must admit, Kitty answered. Thank you for your assistance last evening. For the entire week, in fact. All this would not be possible without you. You are my sister now, Lizzie answered with a smile and placed her hand lovingly on Kitty's arm. And it was my absolute pleasure. Who knows when my turn at a happily ever after will happen? Give it time. Kitty assured her. When James and I ended our arrangement and my parents and I left Woodlock Manor, I was devastated. I was certain that I would become a spinster and spend my life caring for my parents. Not a marriage in sight. But things do follow the path they're meant to, and I believe it will happen for you as well. You are such a wonderful person, Kitty. My brother is truly lucky to have you as his wife. Lizzie said, and squeezed her hand. And I am lucky to have you in my life as well. I have always wanted a sister. I even begged my mother when I was a child, but now that I have one in you, 
A better sister I could not ask for. Kitty's breath caught in her throat at the compliment, truly touched by her new sister's words. She, too, had always longed for a sibling. Your words are too kind, Elizabeth. Please do call me Lizzie. I insist. I never truly adored my name. In fact, I do despise it. Lizzie chuckled. Lizzie suits you better, Kitty answered with a nod. The name was soft, informal, and lovely. Indeed. Lizzie nodded as well and glanced down at Kitty's skirt. Are you going to tell James about... Kitty's heart jumped in her chest at the reminder. She opened her mouth to answer, but they were interrupted by William. Please don't tell me you ladies are still discussing the wedding, William exclaimed, before Kitty could respond to Lizzie's observation. James was directly behind his brother. He gave Kitty a wide grin, which she responded to wholeheartedly. The day has come. Things are perfect, so there is no need to discuss it any further, William continued. Lizzie and Kitty exchanged glances, and Lizzie turned to her youngest brother. Perhaps you should not have spent all your time at the refreshment table, as you are beginning to sound like a foxed gabster brother. I am most certainly allowed to kick up a lark at my own brother's wedding, am I not? William chuckled. Allow me to escort you to find some water, as I am most certainly not nursing you back to health tomorrow morning, Lizzie said, and took William by the arm. Excuse us, she whispered, and winked at James. Kitty watched the siblings walk away, and marvelled at marrying into a family where she got not only a husband, but a sister and a brother as well. What a wonderful day! Kitty smiled brightly at her handsome husband. And I am delighted that everyone is having a wonderful time as well. Perhaps too wonderful. James chuckled and motioned to William. Kitty giggled and took James's hand in hers. Thank you, James. This wedding, the garden, the decorations, it is everything I had dreamed it would ever be. It's a perfect day. Even with my foxed brother, James asked, his lips kicking up with amusement. Even then, she smiled, pure and unadulterated happiness flowing through her. There is something I wish to tell you, but not here. James tenderly caressed her cheek and glanced around them. I am certain that we could slip away for a few moments. I know just the place, she whispered. Lead the way. James winked. Kitty led James through the back of the garden, and his eyes widened as he recognised the hill in the distance. It was the hill he and Kitty had raced to, the race that she had won without a shadow of a doubt. It was also the hill where they had shared their first kiss, as two people wary of love. We are not racing again, are we? James asked with amusement. Kitty chuckled and shook her head. Not today, my love. I wish to bring you here, within sight of the hilltop, to show you how far we have come, and remind you of the wonderful journey that is ahead of us. There is no other man in the entire world I desire beside me, except you. My love, my husband and my friend. Kitty took James's hand, pressing it against her stomach. And now, the father of our child. James's eyes widened with a mixture of disbelief, happiness, and fear. You are with child? Yes, I am. Kitty laughed, happiness unlike anything she'd ever felt before pulsing through her. How did this happen? James exclaimed and shook his head. Of course, I mean, I am aware, but... He looked shocked, but a dawning joy shone through in his expression. Kitty laughed at her husband's reaction to the news. They had spent many mornings speaking of children and how they wished to start a family. They had even toyed with possible names for their future children, but when Kitty had felt the early signs of pregnancy, she had been overwhelmed. It had taken her a week to fully grasp the situation, with the aid of Lizzie, of course, 
and she wanted to inform James as soon as she felt ready. Today, at their wedding, felt like the perfect moment. You are such a silly man, Kitty chuckled and placed her hands around James's shoulders. Tell me what you are thinking, please. I hope you are happy. I am thinking that I did not believe it was possible to love you more than I already do, but now my love for you has simply exploded. I watched you walk toward me from across the garden wearing this beautiful white gown, like an angel, my angel, and time stood still. I love you with all the depth and breadth of my heart, my beautiful kitty. And I am very happy indeed about our news. He curled his hand briefly across her stomach, and she covered his hand with one of her own. I love you, James Seymour, in all your entirety, with everything in me, Kitty declared. We will go on many adventures together, hand in hand, side by side, and we will have the best life imaginable. As long as I have you beside me. James tenderly kissed her lips. You will always have my heart, as you have had from the start, until the day I perish, and likely even after that. As James's kiss became more urgent, Kitty melted into him. The sweet smell of the white flowers from her floral crown filled the air as their love ignited. She knew, deep down inside, that she and James had discovered an everlasting love that would never grow dim. Epilogue Five years later Do not fret, my old graceful lord. Today we shall both take it slow, Kitty whispered reassuringly as she lightly patted the old horse, Lord Windsor, on the back. Even though it had been five years since the illness that had caused her to leave James, Lord Windsor showed no signs of weakness, not even in his advanced years, which came as a great relief for Kitty. During her childhood, she had seen several horses over the Rainbow Bridge. Every one was difficult for her heart to cope with. She was left devastated and heartbroken on each occasion, often for months on end. She was so happy that Lord Windsor's health had rallied so well. The stallion had crawled his way deep into her heart, and she had claimed him as her own. They were both considered fragile, especially now that she was with child once again. Only a few months along, James had attempted to convince her to stay at the estate and rest, but today was simply too momentous an occasion to miss. She might have given up riding to protect her coming child, but walking was still something she intended to do for as long as she could. She left Lord Windsor grazing peacefully and walked back across to where her son was playing near the stables. Mother, he yelled, running over and tugging on her skirt. She glanced down. Yes, my dearest Emmet, Kitty answered with a smile. Young Emmet, who would one day inherit the title of his father, resembled James closely, from his dark brown hair and bright green eyes, to the exact same skin tone. They even sounded alike when they laughed, which was music to Kitty's ears. She would spend hours gazing at them from the wooden bench as they played on the grassy area outside the manor house. Where is Daddy? The young boy, who had his fourth birthday this very day, asked. Daddy is coming back soon. He simply went to fetch something, she explained, as she ran her fingers through Emmett's dark hair. A few moments later, the stable doors opened and Kitty smiled happily as she watched James emerge with the small pony they had purchased for Emmett. Today, her son would ride on his very own steed. It was a bittersweet moment for them as parents, especially Kitty, as she had been the same age as her son when she had ridden on her own for the first time. Of course, her father had been walking beside the horse, clutching the reins throughout the entire journey. James had taken on the role of walking beside Emmett's pony, which he would name himself, as per James's request. James was rather protective of Kitty's condition of being with child once more, especially after they had spent nearly three years struggling to conceive again. 
She understood her husband's concern, but that didn't stop her from inviting herself on this excursion. They would only walk to the meadow, or until Kitty grew tired, but she was adamant not to spoil this wonderful day. James's smile set Kitty's heart ablaze, and the pride he showed as he stood in the sunlight caused an overwhelming feeling inside her. She was the luckiest woman in the entire world to have James in her life. Daddy! Emmett exclaimed as he ran toward his father. My dear boy, come here. I want to show you something. James scooped up his son in his arms and turned to the light grey pony that stood beside them. This, my beautiful boy, is your pony. My pony? Indeed, James answered. I can keep him, Daddy, Emmett asked, wriggling with excitement. You can keep him as long as you wish, James answered. Emmett's small body vibrated with glee as he cheered and threw his arms around James's shoulders. Thank you, Daddy. You are most welcome, son. May you have the happiest of birthdays. Kitty smiled, fighting back tears of happiness that threatened to run down her cheeks. She watched the two most important men in her life share a special moment, simply basking in the joy on both their faces. Are you ready for your first ride on your very own pony? Kitty asked as she approached them. All by myself? Emmett asked, his green eyes sparkling. Indeed, James answered. But there is no reason to be afraid. I will be right beside you. Emmett is not afraid, their son proclaimed. James and Kitty exchanged glances, and she chuckled. He reminds me of myself. Independent beyond his years, James pointed out, and tickled Emmett, who roared with laughter. As I was, Kitty smiled. And still are, James added. Kitty pouted and shook her head. He was right, of course. What does that mean? Emmett asked. It means that you wish to do everything yourself, without any help from anyone. Kitty explained. Not everything, Emmett corrected. Shall we go? James asked after a moment of silence. Before we do, Emmett, you must first name your pony, Kitty stated. I can name him too, Emmett asked. His eyes were wide as he glanced at James. Certainly. He is yours after all, James answered. Emmett pursed his lips as he pondered the name of his horse, studying the animal for a while. Captain Speedy. James raised his brows and blinked at Kitty. Captain Speedy, Kitty repeated. Emmett nodded with great enthusiasm. It is perfect. Indeed, James agreed and placed his hand on the back of the pony. From now and henceforth, this pony will be known as Captain Speedy. Emmett cheered, and James gently placed him on the new leather saddle, made especially for their son. Kitty stepped back, and her heart ached in that bittersweet moment. Emmett seemed even smaller than he was, sitting atop that pony all alone. She had to squash the urge to scoop him into her arms and hold him close, keeping him little forever, while at the same time, she was proud of how he'd grown and how independent he already was. She knew in her heart that Emmett would grow to become a great man and achieve great things. She was simply not certain whether her joy would be containable when that happened. Ready? James asked and glanced at his wife. Kitty was not certain if his question was aimed at Emmett or at her, but she simply nodded. Ready! Emmett cheered with exuberance, waving his arms in the air. Come, Captain Speedy! Kitty weaved her fingers and James's together, then they slowly made their way toward the meadow, walking beside Emmett atop Captain Speedy. Together, they advised Emmett on what to do, and the young boy enjoyed himself thoroughly. The walk lasted nearly an hour. On the way back, Kitty squeezed James's hand. Is something the matter? he asked.
Kitty laughed. Nothing could possibly be the matter with me or this situation. Our son is growing faster than anticipated, but I am incredibly proud of him. As am I, James answered softly. You should not hide your tears, my love. I see them hiding behind the blue of your eyes. They are tears of joy, I assure you, Kitty contended. I am aware, as I was forced to swallow a large lump that settled in my own throat, James admitted. This confession caused Kitty to beam, and she rested her head against his shoulder. And to think, five years ago you didn't even like horses. That is not true, James countered. Though I didn't have the same adoration for them as you had at the time. I am certainly delighted you changed your mind and gave them a second chance, Kitty pointed out and raised her brow. Her dual meaning was obvious. As am I, James answered, understanding her meaning perfectly. When they finally reached the stable, they were just in time to see her parents' coach entering the estate grounds. Pappy and Mammy! Emmett exclaimed. James reached up and in one swift motion lifted Emmett off the pony. As soon as his feet touched the ground, he darted off toward the coach. Careful, Emmett, Kitty warned. I am, Mummy, the boy called out. He stopped abruptly where the grass met the cobblestone path and awaited the arrival of his grandparents, true to his word about being careful. The coach came to a stop and the door opened. Kitty's father was the first to climb out, and as soon as he saw Emmett, he obviously forgot about his wife, whose outstretched hand awaited his assistance. James chuckled and ran toward the coach, so Kitty led the pony to the entrance of the stable. Kenneth was there waiting for her, and offered his assistance. Allow me, your grace. Thank you, Kenneth. The walk back from the meadow was further than I thought, she said, a little out of breath. Are you well, your grace? Perhaps you should sit for a while, a rest. Your offer is kind, Kenneth, Kitty said gratefully, and motioned to the carriage. But I am perfectly fine. Unfortunately, my mother will disagree and will be sure to send me to bed upon sight. It is good that I got the walk out of the way first. Kenneth chuckled and said, Her ladyship means well. Does she always? Kitty asked. If I may be frank, Your Grace, her intentions seem noble, but her execution requires some work. Kitty laughed heartily and nodded. You are absolutely correct. My love, James called out to her, and she glanced across at him. Thank you for your kindness, Kenneth. May you have a lovely day. You as well, Your Grace. I wish you the best of luck. Kenneth smirked. Kitty laughed once more and made her way to James, her parents, and Emmett, who was now perched on his grandfather's shoulders. As they entered the manor house, Emmett telling his grandparents about his pony ride, James grabbed Kitty's hand, and they both stopped walking. Are you well, my love? James asked. You are breathing quite heavily. It means I am out of breath, not dying, Kitty answered. Truth be told, she did feel rather weary. I am perfectly well. Are you certain? You are starting to sound like my mother. James shuddered, which caused her to smile. He said, If there is anything I can do to make things easier for you, please do tell me. My love, Kitty said, and touched his cheek. My life is perfect, as I have you and Emmett, and our new baby, which will be arriving in six months, or perhaps sooner. There is nothing more I could want. James smiled in return and nodded. I feel the same. They walked hand in hand into the manor, with their future bright, filled with happiness, laughter, and more love than most people knew in a lifetime.